which ones are something that, you know, and then also talking about it with the board, sharing it with the members, sharing it with teachers, trying to make, getting everyone, getting their ideas. And of course, uh, there might be some other things that come out from the entry plan, uh, from other areas that we, we may want to consider. Uh, and, and I think that's where we start thinking about what can we do this year, next year, the year ahead. And so we kind of come up with, and I think a lot of that could be um, uh, in-house figuring that out, respecting the local educators and board members and leadership team members to really look at those documents and start look, making, a, a, uh, making some decisions around what we can do. Because uh, they're ultimately the, the people that are doing the work, the teachers and the uh, administrators, you know, really need to have a seat at the table. Um, I think the and also involving parents and letting them know here, here's what we're doing. I mean, that's a huge piece. Uh, I do think that there may be we may have to consider looking at having a, you know, maybe again, if these people are available or not. That's the other thing. It's look, seeing if we have a strategic planning consultant. Uh, or someone coming in and helping helping us dev devise a process that we think is inclusive to get all the stakeholders to at least be heard and given a voice at the table for the uh, for the strategic plan because the, the end product is also ultimately the strategic plan. Right. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, um, Laura. I'm I'm perfectly fine with making a motion, but um, before I do, I'm just curious what the education quality committee what position the education quality committee has taken idea of the review um, i guess that's for you kai yes yeah, so you'll see in our um board goals uh, proposed board goals tonight that uh the, one of the two goals is um that the board would be involved in supporting and participating in this review to the extent that we're needed. And, um, and that along with the first goal, which is the um, student achievement um, you know, review process, that basically that's all working towards getting to a baseline um, and um, being able to start a strategic planning process from a you know, position of strength, I would say. So this, this is very much in line with what the um, the committee imagined, and um, and we think that flows pretty well from what was discussed at the at the um, retreat and um, and in other ed quality uh, committee meetings. So, will you be making a motion, Scott? <laughs> I would be delighted to make a motion to authorize um, the bid process to uh, to begin. Uh, is that is that an adequate motion? Does that do what you need? I I think so. Authorize or is that okay? Process. Yeah, I think so. What do you think, Brian? Authorize the process to move ahead or or curriculum management review? Or the curriculum. Authorizing the spending of any money without board approval. So I would think that a nod from this group, you could just apprise the board later that you know it meets the goals of the board. It meets. What Curry has said, the Ed Quality Committee's recommendations, and why aren't we going to go out to bid? We're just collecting information. Right. right. Yeah, so, so, yeah. Sounds more than adequate to, to me. Yeah. Um, and I'll second that for Scott. Okay. So, Scott and Chris, all those in favor, please raise your hand or say, or say aye. Aye. Okay. All right. All right. So, it passes unanimously. And that brings us to the end of that discussion. And now uh, we have uh, future agenda items. Uh, Brian, you said you had a couple. Yeah, I had, I had a couple. So so I know uh, one of the things that we have is business administrator succession. That's one thing I don't want to skip that over, but uh, I did say I was going to talk more about it today at the finance committee. So I'm going to talk more about it right now very quickly. Uh, so right now, if you notice that we're looking at the job description of the business administrator, it hasn't been updated since 2004. So uh, yeah, so we're, we're, right now what we're doing is uh, we're, I've got, we're, we're working with Lori. Lori's gonna be the uh, expert here it, and is uh, helping us with uh, looking at lots of different job descriptions around the state of Vermont, incorporating what, we, what she does. Some of, I'm sure her job has changed a lot since 2004. So there might be some things that need to be updated. Uh, the goal is to bring that to the board for a job, uh, for, a, for your approval at the next board, not tonight, but the next board meeting and then ultimately, I think I should have some information for the board 
regarding uh, once we get the job description uh, approved, which will be next board meeting, we can start looking at uh, you know, establishing salary parameters, posting it internally uh, throughout the state, nationally, um, and then uh, coming up with a uh, interview committee and uh, the identifying when we're going to actually try to hire this person to replace Lori and hopefully have a train over training crossover time. So uh, there's still some work to do, but we're trying to be very, uh, what's the word, strategic in how we do it. So I think the next uh, next board meeting will have more information about the job description and uh, the actual uh, timeline to, uh, you know, as this timeline becomes solidified uh, over the next few weeks. Okay, great, Brian. So Thank you. Besides, so not to rush you, but so we had the energy project consultant for next agenda item. We also had, we wanted to talk about the facility coordinator, right? Uh, the, we want to talk about planning for capital projects, yeah, and, right? And, 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 and uh, I, I talked to uh, Bill Ford and he's been doing fabulous work with the project management as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and he's still doing some closeout on some projects from the pet summer. There's still some things that are, he's doing closeout right now. But I, I did, uh, you know, I did start talking to him about the list of projects that you had had from last year. He did share that with me uh, today. Uh, there's a lot of projects out there that we could be doing. I mean, like well, a lot of. <laughs> we have yeah. to plan. Yeah, we, yeah. yeah. So, so I think uh, the question comes down to is, should I be inviting Bill Ford to our next finance committee meeting to talk about how we want to? I mean, this could be a very big topic. Uh, what, what have you done in the past? That, that's what we had done in the past, or we had done a separate meeting with the, just the super in, uh, in the past, I had met with superintendent and Bill and, myself okay. and sort of have a strategy of what to show. And that's how we came up with the, the little timeline and stuff, and then have a meeting uh, with the board. But I think we okay. should try to include it on the fourth, but Laurie and I were just talking because we don't have a lot of time of just uh, pencil your calendars, finance committee members for a meeting on November 4th fourth before our other meeting so that we can look at the budget before um, that'll be the first draft so a uh, considering uh, that we can you know like just be open when we start to prepare that agenda for november 4th for the finance committee and see if we are going to have enough time to be able to meet uh, to make bill's time meaningful too so, so is the plan for to meet next no, on november 4th for the finance committee to uh, discuss the next parts of the budget that which Lori will provide us and also invite Bill Ford to it to uh, start talking about capital planning. Yes, and Carrie, Carrie, you have a question. Yeah, I'm just curious, is, is, that, is that date in conflict with the next Ed Quality Committee meeting? I thought we were meeting right before the first meeting in the month, I can't keep it all straight. Oh, yeah, 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 you're right. You're right, Lori, when we were talking about this. So maybe that's what I think it's gonna have to be a different day, Lori, because we do need to meet for budget. Well, sometimes we've met in the morning at like 8.30. Yeah. I also didn't know if that was an option for that day or, I mean, should we just let Michelle try to figure out a date for us? Yeah, yeah that'd, that be, that'd be great. I know that Bill for prefers mornings too. He doesn't like evening meetings. So like an early meeting, it would be great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 And I, and I know that uh, floor, I know we're going to wrap it up here, but uh, the energy project consultant has been on the uh, docket for a while. I, I, we just need to be prepared to, we know we need to, I, I think I need some help with about what, what is the plan for the energy project consultant? What do we need? Um, what yes, do we, want to do? we can we can do that when we're planning for the next agenda meeting because we wanted some input from Bill Ford okay. on that too. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or other comments by finance committee members? No. Thank you. Okay. We will adjourn at seventeen fifty-eight. You have two minutes <laughs> before your next meeting. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I'll start Thank a little you. late. Okay. Many Good thanks minutes. to everybody. Yeah. See you soon. Real soon. Easy, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? Good. Oh, good. You're not. You're not muted, Chris. Just in case you want to know. Oh, thank you. You're welcome.
Good evening, everybody. Uh, I count seven board members so far. Um, if if I'm missing one, oh, Diane, I think has just joined us, which I believe makes eight. Let me just make sure. Great, we seem to be at nine even. So let's come to order at 6.01, according to my clock. Uh, we just moments ago wrapped up a finance committee meeting. So I, um, I'm gonna take it nice and slow at the start to let some of those who, um, who participated in the last meeting, whoever needs to just take a bit of a break before starting in on this one, do so. But um, <clears throat> Very happy that um, that you've all joined us. Um, once again, uh, star six to mute if you're on the phone, and the mute button at the bottom left corner of your screen when you're not speaking. Um, when you're recognized, you're welcome to unmute, or if you're on the phone, uh, press star six to unmute yourself then. Um, if you do want to speak, it helps me a great deal if you can click the raise hand button uh, that you can get to via the participants column on your, um, which also is in the menu at the bottom of your Zoom screen, if yours looks anything like mine. Um, okay. Um, well, we're into month eight of the state of emergency and Washington County has unfortunately vaulted into uh, first place on the list of uh, new cases of COVID relative to population. So even though we may be getting used to this situation, it's still very far from normal. Um, and uh, I can't tell you how grateful I am and uh, all the board members I've spoken to about this are for the work that's being done to keep our schools open under uh, extremely difficult conditions that um, in spite of all our efforts aren't necessarily getting any easier. Um, so, uh, if I've managed to kill enough time by now to allow everyone to get back in who was out or to join us who, who um, intends to do so, um, welcome to our uh, to all participants, uh, board members and members of the public alike, staff, all of you. Uh, first, 2.2 agenda revisions. Do we have any agenda revisions from um, board members or superintendent? Brian. Uh, yes, I have. Uh, I would like to make a agenda revision 3.7 uh, school year calendar change request. School year calendar change request as a new 3.7. Uh, board members, uh, anybody object? to that uh, agenda revision. Um, I don't see it, great. I see one thumbs up, but no, uh, no expressions of, of uh, objection. So it will be done, 3.7 school year calendar change request. Now, um, any other agenda revisions before we move on? If not, we'll go to public comments. And once again, uh, it will help me tremendously if you're able to kindly click on the raise hand button um, in order to, uh, to sort of line up. And um, so I have Ruben, um, old Craig, Ruben, um, 
Please go ahead. Hi, all. Um, long time no see. It's uh, it's good to see you all, even though it's not in person. <laughs> um, I I wanted to quickly pop into this meeting because I've been approached by a, a few community members now, um, who. Uh, called or ran into me or whatever, expressing concern about uh, the process by which um, Keith's replacement and interim IT coordinator um, was, uh, was selected. Um, and I thought it might be useful if I came to you and, and um, just gave some quick background, I, or at least maybe I'll ask the question, would it be helpful <laughs> if I shared um, what communications I've had um, and um, what involvement I did or didn't have in the selection of that uh, interim replacement? Okay, I'm seeing Scott's thumb up and I see Floor's thumb up and I see Brian's thumb up, so I'll, um, so, um, I was, uh, I was contacted by Brian. I don't recall exactly when, um, but, uh, he called, we had, a a wide ranging and, and very friendly phone call. Um, and he gave me, you know, my first question of course is I, I would love to help. I want to help, you know, we're a technology company. This is kind of what we do. And there's obviously a natural affinity there. Um, and so, you know, my first question to Brian was, okay, what, what are you looking for? Um, and it took probably 30 seconds of him listing off what he was looking for before I was like, we, we have the talent and the skills to do all of the things that the school is looking for, but we don't have an excess of any of it. And we don't have one person who can do all of it. And we definitely don't have one person who can do all of it for a period of several months in what is very clearly a full-time or more capacity. Like we're a 10 person company. We just, <laughs> frankly, nobody in Vermont probably has um, excess employees in IT who have management and budgeting and you know strategy and frankly political and all of the other skills like this is a huge really diverse skill set that is needed in order to effectively do this job it's not just a technical thing it's not just you know having an MSP come in and sort of run your infrastructure um, so really the short version of it is is I was like boy that sounds um, like a serious need for a short time and damn, I really wish I could help. <laughs> um, but the reality is that we don't have anywhere near the capacity that it would take to do a remotely effective job at what the district needed. And I did not want to, in a well-intentioned uh, effort to help, end up making the situation worse. Um, so I, I heard again, sort of through this same process that Brian, you were actually able to find somebody who sort of ticks all the boxes that you guys have. And honestly, my, my professional opinion is that that is amazing and remarkable. And because, <laughs> because these folks are not easy to find, um, especially that have capacity to do it right now. So, um, so I guess I just wanted to share that, like, I, you know, there, there was some, some concern that it was somebody from out of state or out of the area. And, and I understand that. Um, of course, we all want to hire Vermonters first, but, um, but there aren't a lot of these folks with extra clock cycles hanging around in the state. So that's really all I had. I just wanted to share that. I wanted to share that Brian had in fact reached out. We had a, a long wide ranging conversation. Um, I uh, shared my admiration for um, sort of on a separate topic, the job that WCU USD has done with the pandemic all the way through. I, I honestly um, expressed deep gratitude and I'll express it to all of you directly 
um, for the job that Washington Central has done with managing education and reinventing the wheel through this pandemic. And, uh, you know, all of you deserve really serious kudos for it. Um, so that's what I had. Too many words, too much talking, but. <laughs> Not at all. Ruben. But I did no. want the record to show that I was at least contacted. <laughs> I, I, I greatly appreciate that, Ruben. Thank you. Thank you for, um, for uh, sharing that. Um, and, and Ruben, thank you for uh, coming uh, here. It's good to see you in face. <laughs> right, likewise. <laughs> and, and I would be very happy to help with the search. And I said that to Brian as well. You know, when, when the actual search is underway, um, I would be happy to, you know, come in and ask the, you know, the hard technical questions or however it is helpful. Um, I'd be delighted to do that. We'll be looking for you, Ruben. So thank you. <laughs> uh, Thanks so much, Ruben. Um, yeah, and, and I neglected to mention beforehand that the board will not respond directly to public comments at the time, but will deal with them uh, during the course of the meeting in the appropriate in the appropriate place. Um, but again, Ruben, many thanks. Um, are there other um, other members of the public who would like to weigh in? Again, it would help me if you could click the um, raise hand button. Uh, I apologize for not raising my hand. I can't find it on the oh, screen. Oh, is, is that you speaking? It, it is, it is I. Please um, then, go ahead. If I, if I could um, drop a couple of quick comments. Um, one, I would like to uh, publicly thank the board for the work that they're doing. Um, while I don't necessarily agree with everything that the board does, uh, I do appreciate the time and the effort um, that you all have put in, in the sense that uh, it's a hard situation. And I certainly would not want to be um, having to make choices right now, the, the choices that you all have to make. Um, so that's, that's one thing. I know I give you all a hard time, but um, you are appreciated. Uh, that's, that's one. Um, two, I would like to thank Brian um, publicly for his um, openness to listen to the staff. Um, we, we just got some news today at our, our staff meeting um, that uh, felt good about being listened to um, and starting to be aware that um, though we may be pushing in ways that other districts are not the boundaries of education, the staff is burned out. Um, and it, it, it's, it feels good to be heard and to understand that like, this is not sustainable. Um, and um, the last is I was just wondering that with the new spikes in, um, especially in our, our county with COVID numbers, has a, a threshold been set um, in terms of when, when we, it feels unsafe at this point um, seeing how the numbers right now are higher than they were in March, um, if I if I did my math correctly. So I was just also wondering about um, has there been a, a fail safe number um, that can be publicly shared? Thanks. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, and your question is is noted. Um, you got it too, Brian. About the threshold. Yeah, I can I can respond to that in my report. We'll, we'll, we can wait if you want. Um, okay. And until we get to your point. Oh, sorry. Sorry, just to be not at all. Um, so uh, other members of the public who wish to speak, you're welcome to. And, and if you can't find the, um, uh, the raise hand button, uh, please feel free just to pipe up. We shall move on to 3.1, uh, student reports, Towns and Anna. Hey, uh, I think Anna had to, it's going to be a little bit late because um, of a, a volleyball game, um, but she was a huge help in, uh, in crafting the, the student report. She just uh, couldn't be here for the actual reading of it. Um, 
as far as news goes for this week, um, this week is the senior night for athletics, um, where the seniors are uh, seniors who are doing sports are going to be, you know, uh, uh, recognized for their sports contributions and such. Um, today was the pre-ACTs for, uh, I believe, the 10th grade um, at school. And today also held the first of two club fairs, virtual club fairs, as um, clubs have had to adapt to not having a lot of in-school time with uh, the, um, they have had to adapt and the virtual club fair today for the 11th and 12th grade and virtual club fair next week for the 9th and 10th grade um, are there so that students who are interested in joining clubs, there is a, um, reachable way to engage with them and to talk with people who run clubs and to kind of get information about how they're going to happen this year um, because it's really different for each every for all the different organizations um this week uh i think that you know on a more um emotional level i think that i have i've heard a lot more um nervousness coming from fellow from students and um, also teachers um, regarding the increased number of cases um, and I think that is impacting uh, it, it is really impacting uh, everyone in our school and everyone in the community um, I think people are feeling uh, wary and uh, nervous um, Yes, um, the U32 Chronicle um, has started publishing new articles. Um, we're probably gonna see a bunch of profiles of new staff members coming out being published pretty soon. Um, and uh, hopefully some other interesting stories. And then um, I guess finally this weekend is the um, High school cross country state championships, um, which we, which uh, our district will be competing in, and I, I hope that we do well. That's all for the student report. Are there any uh, questions or comments? Wonderful times. Yeah, board member questions, comments. Floor. I have one question and it's not related to any, but it came up in our finance committee. Are you ordering lunch or breakfast through the food program? <laughs> Do you have any input on that? <laughs> well, um, I think uh, I, I, I am ordering lunch um, and okay. breakfast. Um, I think that honestly, the school has done a really fantastic job, um, not only uh, providing lunches, but also meeting dietary restrictions. Um, and kind of providing options um, at a time where like it's harder to facilitate that kind of ordering and interaction. Um, and I, I think that I just, a, a, a huge, huge thank you to anyone who has helped to, to make that possible. Um, because it, I am, I am very impressed with uh, what, is, what is being done. We'll pass your gratitude along to the federal government, Towns. Um, are, are there other board members who wish to um, ask Towns questions? Uh, if not, at the moment, maybe I could just, um, I'm wondering, Towns, you're off, you're on an off week this Damn. week, correct? Yeah. So how do you, and, and Anna, uh, Anna's an 11th grader, right? Yes. Um, so how do, you, how do the two of you sort of stay connected to, your, um, to the ninth and 10th graders, to the middle schoolers, let alone to the elementary schoolers? That's, that's a really good question. Um, I think that uh, there are a few ways. Um, as far as middle school goes, I'm, I'm really lucky because my younger brother is a middle schooler, so I get all of the direct information right from him. <laughs> and he is uh, very open about his complaints sometimes. Um, um, as, the, as far as um, 
actually, uh, as far as engaging elementary schools, this is something that me and Anna have been talking about, especially right now. Um, and we are trying to figure out a way where we could potentially uh, zoom into elementary classes to talk to them, to talk to elementary schoolers directly. Um, it's, it's still in like the very early stages of um, our ideas and development. Um, but that's something that we're, we're hoping to be doing um, at different points throughout the year, just to get a handle on things. Uh, this sounds wonderful. Yeah. Um, I'm excited. Great. Uh, we, we encourage it um, for sure. Uh, okay. Uh, anybody else? Board members? Questions for Towns before we move on? If not, then um, we'll go to Brian for the superintendent's report. And, and Brian, um, uh, you can continue before I so rudely cut you off a moment ago, answering Daniel's question. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, the, uh, and I appreciate you holding me to, to, the, to the rules. I really do, so thank you. Uh, the uh, yeah, so, ba so basically, uh, the state has the, the agency of education has not yet set a threshold. I am not sure if they they will be setting a threshold. Uh, I'll be having a meeting with them tomorrow uh, with the secretary. I have my weekly meetings with the secretary. Uh, there is a lot of conversations right now. I can tell you about the uh, holiday travel. Uh, you know, what what are, what are different districts? What are different states even doing around the country? With regards to uh, holiday travel and are schools going remote during that time? Are they not? There's, there's positives and negatives about it. So uh, I, we may be getting some guidance. I'm anticipating some guidance from the AOE either as early as tomorrow, but maybe even uh, sometime the, by the end of the week, maybe early next week. That's what I'm hoping. Uh, but but uh, we're just waiting to hear back from uh, the Agency of Education. I think I'm sure that'll be a topic. At our meeting tomorrow with the secretary, um, the the other things is I will say that yet yeah, I think within the last uh, week I've, I've I've definitely noticed a lot more uh, folks getting nervous and rightfully so now that we have more reported cases in our uh, backyard uh, in the towns right next to us so we are definitely keeping a close eye on that um, we so there are people feeling anxious and, and I do get that and I and again. I understand that we. Uh, I did meet with the leadership team uh, today, uh, and uh, we did talk uh, talked with the principals today uh, about how we can uh, support our teachers and staff during this time period. Uh, and and uh, you'll see. I'll talk more about it at three point seven. That's why we uh, asked for a calendar change request, and I'll go into that in detail there. Um, the um, other piece is we had from the last meeting. We did have some updates. A, a quick update on a. The remote learning piece uh, from our last time. I know that's been a hot topic in our in our uh, community. The uh, numbers as of September 30th that were enrolled in our remote learning uh, academy was 84, and we are now down uh, to 76. Uh, so the numbers are going down. Families are returning to the uh, live in-person instruction. Uh, so that 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 is what's been happening. We anticipate that we we may have some more families going back into live person instruction uh, by the end of the first quarter. Uh, so we may have, uh, so that numbers may continue to change. The uh, big piece I know that we talked about with the VTVLC um, was uh, the, the transition and what are we doing for our families? And I can have Jen, uh, Jen Miller talk more about that. I see she's here. I would like to, she's been doing a, leading a major effort in this area. And I thank her for her leadership in this area. The um, uh, the sketch she's been working on developing an opportunity for kids to attend the VTVLC, but also have some time with their classmates in the uh, with uh, with the two teachers that they had all previously. And I can let Jen uh, talk more. Jen, if you have anything else to add in there, sure. Um, so I just want to say, you know, I have had the opportunity to reach out to families um, to attend the remote. Uh, faculty meeting the other day and to, um, to spend time and a lot of email back and forth with, um, with Kate and Lisa to try to do our best to, um, to wrap around families and provide a level of connection 
with the remote learning school at Washington Central and also a level of support and predictability for VTVLC as that change has been a big one. So, um, you know, helping to establish a, a routine calendar, uh, providing, uh, I'm working right now, I'm providing the packets of materials to accompany the modules and making sure that um, kids and families at VTVLC know that they can reach out anytime. I've also spent a lot of time talking with the VTVLC teachers themselves to ease the transition. And um, while obviously nothing is perfect, I think that um, folks are really committed to being constructive and, um, and working hard to, to make the best of the situation. Uh, we all want the same thing, which is to make sure that our students are successful. That's what I would add. Thank you, Jen. Uh, and I just want to publicly thank you for your leadership uh, in this. I know it's not been uh, this has not been an easy uh, task for anyone, anyone involved. So uh, thank you, Jen. Uh, Seconding that. So uh, those are my major reports. Uh, I know, I know, uh, you know that that's basically my major report from three point two. Uh, I I don't know if you want me to go into central office job descriptions or. Just yeah, um, maybe first, if, if any board members have um, have a question uh, to ask Brian about where we are so far. Karen, uh, uh, Chris, yes. Um, did Car you said Kari? Kari have his hand up? No, he was shaking his head. <laughs> oh, he was. Yes. Okay. Um, I have a couple <laughs> questions, Brian, in terms of the. Um, uh, the question that Daniel raised, um, and you addressed it a little bit on in terms of the threshold. Um, can you describe what what the threshold coming to a, an analysis of, of of setting a threshold? What that criteria that would involve, and whether whether we should establish a threshold that might not be the one that the um, AOE sets. I mean, especially in light of the you know the, the sounding that. Um, some students and staff are becoming nervous as the caseload increases. Okay, so so uh, yes, I can respond to some of that. Uh, that I that I with the information I know, they look at certain metrics at the Department of Health. I know one of the big ones is the infection rate, uh, and uh, they've been looking at that. Uh, and they they were hesitant to give a, an exact number of what the threshold would be. And I have not seen anything of that changed. I can definitely talk about uh, establishing a local threshold and ask that question tomorrow. I mean, I'm, I mean, it's a great question to ask. Should we consider establishing a local threshold? Um, you know, I, I don't want to. You know, I'm not going to say anything else. But you know, currently, we're, we've been we've been fortunate as a district. Uh, I know I know it's right outside our doors, though. So I don't want to be naive and say it's not going to happen here, right? So, um, so I think. Establishing a local threshold may be something uh, I can we can definitely look into, but uh, we are following the AOE, and I can definitely raise that question tomorrow. Okay, and I have a couple of follow-ups. One is that um, do we currently have the capacity, if we needed to, to shift to all remote um, learning? So uh, the question you're asking is one of the reasons why I've asked for 3.7 <laughs> tonight. Uh, oh. The the uh, the capacity to shift to all remote learning. We have uh, a lot of capacity developed. Uh, I think it's also about developing our teacher capacity to deliver uh, the uh, remote capacity, remote learning across the district, and uh, right. that'll be a part of my topic at 3.7. Okay, and then I have one more follow-up question is. Um, do we have a specific policy on communicating uh, to the community at large um, if we have a positive COVID test result? Yeah, so we have put out a, uh, the COVID-19 coordinator myself uh, has worked with the Department of Health. We have put out a mailing out to the staff, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, to all the communities about, a, it's called the COVID-19 action guide about what folks can expect if and when uh, we have a positive case. Uh, we have sent it out to our communities. I believe we're working on getting it posted in our website. We are trying to update our website, especially the reopening website, as now that we've reopened, there's a question about do we, how much do we need to keep on the reopening website and how much do we just wanna make sure that folks have 
something that they can refer to. So we do have a COVID-19 action guide. Uh, I'm making sure it's getting posted on the website, but it has gone out to our communities. Okay, thank you. And the communication plan is Scott, when you, in there. Sorry. So, Scott, this is Jill. I have a comment when you have time. I'm I'm just phoned only Thanks, tonight. Jill. Um, w w may I go to Jonas first and then to you? Uh, please, yes, I just wanted to let you know. Very good, thank you, Jill. No, no, go ahead to Jill. I can, I can follow up. Uh, always okay. courteous. Thank you, Jonas. Always. Um, <laughs> thanks. I just had a really a comment, Brian, as you're going into talking to the um, AOE about the idea of thresholds, which is just to make sure we're distinguishing between, um, you know, the, the numbers matter, but it also matters if we're talking about a, an outbreak where um, the contacts are traced and we and yeah. sort of know uh, who's being affected versus a community spread situation, which doesn't appear we're yet in. Obviously, I'm not the health department, so I will rely mm -hmm. on them. But I just want us to be careful that we, you know, think it through. Um, it, it, we, we consider those distinctions. So just as you're going into that meeting, I think that's an important distinction to, to consider. Okay, understood. And uh, I know that uh, our COVID-19 coordinator, Elizabeth Worth, has been doing, I, she's on the phone with the Department of Health. She's on the phone with families. She's on the phone with teachers and staff members. Yeah, I don't know if she sleeps, but I, I, she's around the clock on this. So, uh, well, I'll definitely uh, uh, make sure that when we, we talk about it, I'm sure we're going to have a very good conversation tomorrow, Jill, with the secretary. Oh, I'm sure you will. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, before you move on, Jill, can you say dis distinction between what, just so I can get it in the minutes? Oh, sure. The distinction between a cluster of cases. Yeah. where all the cases are connected to each other from a known uh, source or event versus a sense that we're having a, a community spread. Okay. Where the where it's not in community spread it's not clear where the where the cases are coming from. So it's a very different um, level of it causes me a different level of anxiety. Um, you know, if we don't know where the cases are coming from that's more more concerning. Thank so you. it's community spread versus an outbreak. Yeah, it's okay. a cluster. Very good. Thank you both. And, and Lisa, um, thank you for breaking in. Um, you have blanket authority to do that whenever you need to. Thanks. Jonas? Uh, so I wanted to talk about uh, contact tracing and, and testing. I, you know, I think probably most of us have seen the Digger article from this morning talking about um, you know, who's considered a close contact um, and, you know, you know, just like, you know, I think it was Daniel uh, who asked, you know, what is the threshold for, for closing schools and, and should we think about, you know, a higher threshold than that? The, you know, the, the, the Digger article indicates that, you know, if masks and distancing and all the protocols are followed, that if someone in a classroom uh, tests positive, then the teacher and the other students in that classroom are not considered close contacts, right, for the purpose of testing and tracing. Um, you know, it, I, I don't know if Elizabeth is here. I don't see her name on, on the call. Um, but I'd just love to hear about, you know, what your thinking is and what her thinking is about, you know, who is a close contact, what the repercussions of being a close contact are, um, and whether any thought has been given to you know, expanding, you know, our definition of what a close contact is. So uh, this, you have a very timely question, Jonas. Uh, uh, a teacher had recently reached out to uh, Elizabeth today asking the same exact type of question. And so uh, uh, she did uh, respond to the question and I can tell you what she said. So I, so she's not here. So, uh, so normally I would defer to her. So, but I'm, what I'm gonna try to answer the question is, is it regarding the contact tracing? And it says in this article, every situation is somewhat unique. Uh, and we would ultimately depend on the contact tracing team to help advise, to, help to advise us on who, sh who should be considered a close contact. The Department of Health has, a great, has been a great and reliable source in these matters. Uh, they take into account all factors, including time spent unmasked in the classrooms while eating, because uh, I think that this is where it came out of where students were eating in classrooms with the, and didn't have their masks on. Uh, we do understand that there is that the concern about being unmasked with, with unmasked children in a classroom. Uh, Elizabeth has spoken with professionals at the state level who acknowledge that 
though there is some risk, it is not considered a major factor in the transmission of the virus to this point, especially if staff remain vigilant in following the precautions that we've set up, uh, wearing a mask and maintaining at least a six foot distance from the unmasked students. In most situations that Elizabeth has heard about, and there have only been a few in Vermont, the contact tracers have identified some staff as well as some students to be close contacts. Of course, in these situations, there can be a lot of fear and no one would ever be prohibited from taking a test if they felt they may have been a close contact, even if the Department of Health did not assess them to be at risk. Uh, Elizabeth is in, the, is in constant contact with the Department of Health and the COVID coordinators from throughout the state of Vermont and we'll reach out to them in case there is more information that is valuable to share. So I, I, I hear that, um, you know, and, you know, that, that all makes sense. Does the district have the ability or the authority to, to denote who is a close contact, you know, a, you know, above and beyond, you know, what the Department of Health may determine? I mean, we all, I mean, six feet and masks, right? There's nothing magic about six feet. Right. You know, these are guidelines to prevent the majority of cases. A mask doesn't protect people 100 percent. Six feet, uh, you know, six feet of distance doesn't pr you know, protect people 100 um, percent. You know, I, I would, you know, just like, to, you know, has the district considered, you know, have you considered, you know, you know, should this happen? Do you have it in the back of your mind that, you know, maybe we need, you know, maybe we should be calling these people close contacts, you know, you know, even if the Department of Health says no, don't worry about it. Yeah, uh, what, what I can tell you is uh, the COVID-19 coordinator uh, has been sending, making sure that anytime someone has the sniffles or is not feeling well, over, uh, over, uh, over an abundance of caution, uh, she has been uh, making sure, uh, letting parents know that, you know, we can't tell parents to take your kid to the doctor or go to the doctors, but what we can do is uh, you know, recommend, hey, you might want to think about going to the doctors if you have the sniffles. And I know that she's been work talking to families and they go to the doctors and the doctors almost 100% of the time say, go get a test. And so we've had a lot of folks get tested over the last two months with COVID, uh, COVID tests and, you know, knocking on wood, but um, you know, we've been very fortunate so far. So I think that we have been operating over as an, over on an overabundance of caution uh, with regards to this. However, uh, if your question is, does the district have the authority above and beyond what the Department of Health is defining as a close contact? That's what I'm hearing you're saying. Uh, I think that uh, we, uh, we, we've been deferring a lot to the Department of Health and she's been constantly working with the Department of Health with these uh, cases when they do come up. Uh, and I don't wanna say cases of COVID cases, just uh, cases where someone's sick, right? She's been working on that round the clock with the, with the nurses and the uh, families and our schools. Uh, and I know most of the time they're ultimately getting COVID tested. So, um, so we've been, uh, so, Kim, I, so I can ask more about that with her when she's here. And I can also uh, reach out when I, I can ask that question tomorrow, because I think it's a good one. Uh, right. But I, I, so I, the, the reason I ask right in the, I think the, the one of the opening paragraphs of that story, uh, you know, an, an unnamed Chittenden County teacher said, uh, you know, if I had no idea if I was teaching in a student in my room tested positive, I would not be considered a close contact and I would not be given the ability to stay home and stay safe. So, you know, what I'm really thinking about here is, you know, are the you know, teachers and staff, you know, I got to tell you, you know, if, if I was in a room, you know, with a bunch of people for hours and hours a day, you know, six feet and masked regardless, if one of them tested positive, you know, I want to stay home. Um, yeah. And so I, I, I can totally understand that sentiment. I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, more next time about Elizabeth's thoughts about that. Thank you, Jonas. Um, first, Lindy, and then Chris. This kind of is a good follow up to Jonas, because I work in a district where we had a contact and the next day we had four classes go remote while they waited for Department of Health to decide who was a close contact and who should be tested. Um, there were no questions that people who had been in that pod of children, um, it just was, they immediately went remote, those classes. Then the Department of Health contacted people if they felt they needed to be 
but all of our communication was, if you feel you need a test, go have a test. If you have the sniffles, don't come to work. And mm -hmm. the teachers have a drop down menu that's absent because of COVID versus just absent for something else, I guess, so they can keep track. Um, but I think that the schools, we've never been told there's a threshold where I'm working, but obviously the reaction was the minute they found out that there was a positive test in a family, the, those classrooms that had had contact were on remote. Um, so the schools, I think, have the right to do what they need to do. And as a citizen, we have the, if I had been around any of this group that's in Washington County, I'd go have a test. Um, because Dr. Levine said, it's not from the playing and competing, it's from the carpooling and getting together before and after and things like that. So um, I, I think if our COVID director is contacting people and doing things, it'd be awfully hard to put a threshold so we know what's going on and our schools are so different in size and how many people are in the buildings. But being transparent and public with information is very important. And I just see our COVID director has joined us. So, uh, <laughs> hi, Elizabeth. <laughs> so maybe we can ask some questions here now. Uh, one of the, uh, I got a couple of questions that came uh, that I was tabling and writing down. Uh, the one was, uh, should we establish a local threshold uh, Elizabeth, uh, at our district level? Uh, and it has the state set a threshold uh, for closing schools. And then does, uh, we should be aware of the distinction between a cluster of cases versus community spread. And uh, do, does the district have the authority above and beyond uh, what the Department of Health is defining as a close contact? Um, before Elizabeth answers those, Brian, should we yeah. have Chris and Floor? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. We can lengthen that list, perhaps. <laughs> So, Scott, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so I, I agree with Lindy, and I think the district can set um, their, their own standard, and anything from the um, AOE or the Department of Health is probably a floor, no pun on our colleague, uh, and not a ceiling um, in terms of requirements. So, you know, the, the, I think the AOE and the Department of Health can establish the basic minimum but we can exceed that, um, I think, through through policymaking, actually. So, um, thank you. Thanks, Chris uh, and Flora. Mine is not super super important. I just had a question. I I love the COVID uh, uh, action guide that you sent. It was super helpful. Uh, one question before we put it online is: uh, Was there any reason we couldn't use any? Are the kids in the pictures? from our schools? It didn't look like that, but, so is there any reason why we couldn't like uh, change those pictures to some local color? Uh, just a question, we don't need to resolve it right now, just uh, yeah. you know. I, I was, uh, I, I've actually been, uh, I, 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 we probably could add pictures. I was so, I, I, was, I really just wanted to get it out because uh, every single district around us has had cases and we, we've we been fortunate. Sure. And I just figured the moment we just get it out, uh, but we could add pictures if, if we needed to. Okay, no, it is the question. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, art is important. And uh, so, um, I, I, Brian, I, I have no one else from the board with a raised hand, so we can go to Elizabeth if you like. Elizabeth, do you need me to repeat the questions or do you got them? <clears throat> Well, let me just start. I, I think there's some general comments I could make. And, and um, I do think that um, we will depend a lot on the Department of Health. And I think that they've done a great job so thus far, as far as I can tell. And it's not been a lot of cases in schools. You know, this more recent outbreak is, is distressing and it points out how easily spread this is. Um, I think that um, 
as far as protocols and those, my only hesitancy with that is that um, our schools are very different and, and cutting, putting a number on, um, you know, this many cases means we shut down the district or we shut down a school seems, I mean, I, I think that we have the, uh, that opportunity, should, that, should it happen that we could do something like that? You know, in Montpelier, I know now, you know, they, they closed a couple of classes and um, they didn't close the rest of the school. And there's a lot of people nervous and that's why they opened all those um, sites this week to get tested. So people can always go get a test if they're concerned, even if the Department of Health says, you, we don't consider you a close contact, nor do we consider that there's, that there's um, a risk to keeping that, the school open. And I think people asked about, we can always do more than the Department of Health says, but they're going to, they will set a limit and say, really, you need to, if they say, say you need to shut this class or close the school for this amount of time, of course, we would abide by that. And there may be some situation that we know about that makes us feel like we should do more. But I think that's more individual than setting a policy at this point. I don't know. I don't know how you would come up, come about. It depends on, um, how many cases, who the cases are, how they spread, if they have spread in the, in the school or not. Um, so there's a lot of factors to consider and we'd certainly do that. Um, and the other thing I wanted to just mention is that, um, you know, in terms of a lot of questions have come up about what to tell, or how are we gonna know? Will we know if there's a positive case? And um, I think that, you know, in the document that we put out, we tried to explain that um, I, I don't have any hesitancy about letting the district know if there's been a positive case in the school that has, has the potential, has, has they've considered that there is possible spread in the school. But if you have a case where the person who's positive, maybe if, maybe part of the district in so, at some level, but they have not been in the school while they were infectious. That's not something that we, number one, we may not know it unless a person has told us. The Department of Health doesn't call us and say, oh, you know, this person is positive, but they weren't in the school when, you know, when they were infectious. They're not going to tell us that. So we depend on, and of course, you know, um, the rumor mill is great and people hear a lot of things. And I've heard a lot, I keep hearing about this case in, at U32 that's positive, but I have no knowledge of that. Nobody has told me that, I don't know that, but but it's it, it comes, comes around. So I think it helps people to understand that we would absolutely let people know if there was a case in the school, we wouldn't say necessarily, we wouldn't say if it was a staff or student, but we would say that there, there was, you know, um, it was somebody who tested positive who had been in the school during that period when they were infectious. And then that particular pod, you know, depends on how well the pod is organized and depends on a lot of factors whether we consider how to close which portion of a school. And you know, all the situations that have happened thus far in Vermont have, except for the one in Montpelier, which is still, still not finished, I don't think. Um, there's been no spread in the school and they've closed whatever portion they have, but there's been no, no known spread that we, we have been made aware of anyway. Um, so I don't know if that helps at all. Were there other questions? Um, Ryan, I think I Jonas, Jonas may have another question. Yeah, just real quick, so, uh, Elizabeth and anyone else who may have information about this of the schools, um, of the schools, you know, locally, you know, in the Harwood district, Montpelier, um, you know, and the district where, where Lindy works, do we know if any class or school closures that have happened because of those cases have been done, you know, on the, you know, with the guidance of the Department of Education, Department of Health, or were those determinations to make those closures made by the district itself? I, th I think what I know, what I understand is that the Department of Health made recommendations. Oftentimes, <laughs> In, in, it seems as though the schools have done more than that. They've decided to close everything, you know, and it's been new for everybody. People aren't sure what to do, they're afraid. And plus it has to do with staff. You know, I know that the case in um, uh, across at Brook, 
the, the fear was at, when they initially did the um, contact tracing, they thought, the school thought there were gonna be a lot of faculty who were gonna be, a, were not able to teach. And so they didn't think they'd have enough uh, faculty to run the school. So that's why they made that, you know, they shut this, I think they shut the whole school down for a, a period of time. But that was why, and the Department of Health didn't feel like that was necessary. But we have other factors like, like staffing, you know, and so there may be situations where, and there may be situations where faculty, even though we say you you are not at risk, they may not feel that way. You know, fear is an important thing to, to address and we have to, you know, support those teachers. If they wanna go and get a test, they don't necessarily have to stay out after they get the test, but they may want to do that. And we, we need to be flexible about that. And we have been so far, you know, so, um, so anyway, I know that particular situation. So I think that nobody's done less, but some people have done have done more. I don't think I don't think in Montpelier they've done more than was suggested, but I'm not sure about all the details. No. Thank you, Elizabeth. That's really really helpful. Yes, uh, agreed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. <clears throat> and I, I know this is um, this is the number one issue, not only here but across the land. Nevertheless, I must um, remind us of our prosaic duties to get a certain amount of work done tonight. Um, are, are we ready to move on to central office job descriptions? Yes. Okay, Brian. Okay, so uh, if you look in your packet, there are, you know, the, the central office job description uh, parade continues. I uh, was able to work with uh, some of our folks, our head custodians in our district. I also worked with Bill Ford, uh, who's, who's our current clerk of the works. Uh, and we came up with, uh, we were able to combine and create two different job descriptions. Uh, one is for the clerk of the works and one is for the uh, director of facilities. Uh, it's, I'm not asking the board to fill the director of facilities. I just want, I'm just asking the board to, to approve the uh, job responsibility. I wanted to delineate the differences between the clerk of the works and the director of facilities. Uh, they're really two different types of jobs, uh, really two different skill sets. And uh, we, did, we do not have a director of facilities uh, job description, nor did we have a clerk of the works. So we had to do a lot of work uh, asking uh, different districts around the state uh, to send in what they have. It's been a big project to get this, uh, to get these two job descriptions up. But uh, so I was asking for the board to uh, approve it, uh, to look these job descriptions over. If you have any questions, uh, I can answer them. And then uh, if there's anything else that, you, that stands out to you, I would uh, ask you to adopt them. So I guess we should have a motion to adopt first and then we can have the discussion. Oh, Brian, yes. There is one, there is one thing here though, uh, that I've been continually looking at uh, with any of these job responsibilities I, I, I ask you to uh, consider. I always um, put in uh, an area that should be in every job description just because I'm the superintendent, I, I like it. I like it like that way. Uh, but uh, it's, it's having other duties and responsibilities at, uh, as assigned by the superintendent. And so uh, just adding that I did not, under the clerk of the works piece, for some reason in our last edit, it did not get in there. So I would like to add that under the supervisory responsibilities, uh, just because it gives us more leeway to use the clerk of the works um, as, as I can. It gives me more leeway to use, use that per person. Yes, that, that sounds great. So it should be understood that, um, that each of these job, job descriptions has that other duties as assigned wild card. As assigned um, by the superintendent. <laughs> as assigned by the superintendent, right, yes. okay. <laughs> um, so uh, do we have a motion? So Laura? move, yeah, so move both descriptions. Thank you, uh, second? Second it, it's Diane. Thank you, Diane. So floor moves, Diane seconds, discussion. Uh, Diane. Um, oh, sorry. Um, no, no, Diane no. and then Chris. Good. Oh, so sorry. So um, maybe this was explained last time because I know the tech, the um, IT job description was long as well. But is there a reason why it's each one is six pages long? <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, uh, well, I think the, uh, the idea is the, uh, if you, and I work with the, uh, our, even though I do not have an HR director, I have an HR coordinator and she works with the HR uh, group around Vermont and everyone is adding in these uh, other pieces in here uh, for communication, interpersonal skills, uh, qualifications, and the physical effort and stress. So they're adding these pieces in here. Uh, and this is kind of like just what best practice is now uh, for these job responsibilities. Even though I know that uh, sometimes it's usually been a page or a two pager, added these, they now become much longer because we need to make sure we're, we're uh, documenting physical effort and stress and frequency of how they can, because apparently that uh, could open up uh, districts to liability that we may not want to have. So I think the HR is becoming a HR best practice to add those into job responsibilities. Thanks, Brian. Chris. Yeah, um, so I have just a couple of questions. One is, um, is there a specific evaluation process in these documents that I missed? And if, if it's not there specifically, should it be added? My second is, who is the actual hirer? Is it the, is it the board or is it the superintendent? The, the, uh, so the, the, uh, you, we don't typically put an evaluation in the, uh, the evaluation process in the job responsibilities. That's separate. Uh, and that's that. That's for all positions. Uh, the 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 other piece is to the, the second question was you want to repeat that one more time. Just want to make yeah. Who who actually hires? Is it the board that hires each of these positions, or is it the superintendent? So the superintendent uh, will conduct an interview and and uh, or set up an interview process for any of these positions, uh, and then make a recommendation to the board if we're hiring a personnel an actual person to fill these positions. Okay. And then you would have to approve it. And it would be, it would kind of, the person, if we hired a person uh, who would be full-time or, or half-time and receiving benefits, they would appear in the, uh, in the section on our board packet personnel item, usually number six. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Chris. Um, any, other, any other questions or, or comments? Or are we ready to move to a vote? I just have a- Laura. I just have a comment. I heard Brian saying that he's not trying to fill the facilities director yet. I did want to put that into our next finance committee meeting just so that everybody is aware. I think that it's a position that we, in my opinion, we do want to fill to make sure that our superintendent and our principals are doing, you know, the instructional leadership rather than facilitating your facilities coordination. That's just my so just because you said that, Brian, I want to make sure that people didn't think that that didn't mean that we're not looking into it. That's all. Great. Thank you, Flora. Thank you, Flora. Um, so shall we vote then? Uh, all in favor of approving the motion by Flora, seconded by Diane, to approve these two job descriptions with the addition of um, other duties as assigned by superintendent. Uh, please click your yes button. No, click your no button. And I am seeing 10 yeses and zero no's. And I'm a yes too, Scott. Oh, that makes 11. Thank you, Jill. Excellent. Okay. Um, so the motion carries. And we can move on to 3.3 leadership team report which um, uh, consists of school update, facilities update, and upcoming events, and um, all of which sounds very upbeat. Um, is this for real, or is that just sort of natural educator optimism? <laughs> I'll let the leadership team answer that. So, uh, but uh, I, I, I know I'm very upbeat, but, uh, but I'm always upbeat, so uh, I'm just, uh, uh, just extremely proud of our, our district and our uh, our teachers and, and, and families uh, leading the way uh, through this reopening. Uh, so I'm a so I, I basically I'll just I'll, I'll let each principal uh, present uh, their update, and they can also uh, do their do they usually do their this is new for me so this is our first time so I do we usually do school updates and then facility updates or should we just let the principal do both at the same time? Would that be think, helpful? Yeah, let the principal do, do both mix together um, with their usual, um, you know, economy of words. Yes. 
I see someone has their hand raised. I, yeah, actually, Lindy has her hand up. So maybe we'll, um, Lindy, would you like to weigh in before we go to the leadership team? I wanted to weigh in because of your comment about the optimism and is this real? And as a board member, I appreciate seeing um, such an upbeat report and the details about the activities going into it. When I read it during the week, um, I it re-energized me about my faith in the leadership team and our schools and what we're doing. So I appreciate getting this. And in this world right now, having something that's optimistic and you can, I can feel the dedication of these leaders through the writing in their report. So I really appreciate it as a board member. Beautiful, Lindy. Thank you. Thank you. So um, take her away. Okay, we'll start with Berlin. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yep. All right, great. So some of the things in my, my update um, just really kind of tried to capture the uh, the reopening and just how the first month has gone with the feeling of positivity. Um, I think some of us, you know, we prepared for the for the best and didn't know, you know, exactly maybe how things would work out. But just I have to just say the students and the teachers um, and even the the families, just their patience and 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 understanding of the changes um, have really made it come together in in just such a such a positive way. Um, it's it is hard. Uh, it's stressful. Um, it's it's different, but kids are so resilient. Um, they've they've just been amazing. Um, so it's been for us a, a really good really good opening, considering that we're in a pandemic. Do you want me to keep going with facilities or? Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, in in my facilities piece, I talked about our our driveway and our circle. Thank you very much. Our paving is is complete, and uh, if you drive by, um, it just looks wonderful. And it is even more wonderful to drive on it and walk on it, and it's just great. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, we still are waiting for the parking lot lighting to be complete. There are still some pieces on order for that, um, but just a really fantastic job um, with the whole project. Um, <clears throat> I did mention also, and I, I definitely have to to announce this, our our uh, state health inspection in our kitchen got a perfect 100 score this past week when the state department came to uh, do our inspection. Um, we usually get 98 or 99, so we're really happy that we got 100%, and uh, just it's a proud moment. So, thank you. We can move on to Callis. Thank you very much. And uh, getting that 100 is no small feat. As a former principal, uh, that's you sometimes get in the high 90s, but 100 is very nice, Mr. B. Very nice job over there at Berlin. Moving on to Callis. Callis, um, I, I think I put this in my section of the report. I the, All the hard work that we have done since last spring to really think about what it means to reopen um, both physically and emotionally safe for kids and, and families and, and staff has begun to pay off because despite the worry and it's there, despite the nerves and the hard work, um, and it is, it is um, a burden at times, despite that, I still see the joy and the passion on my staff's faces every single day. They see the beauty in connecting with kids and connecting with their colleagues and feeling like we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Um, and that is a really beautiful thing to see. The I have um, an intern and an admin intern this year, Kelly McMartin. She has decided, crazy girl, that she is considering she might wanna be a principal someday. I don't know what she's thinking, but she has taken on um, the sort of tackling how to continue to improve our approach to instruction and intervention and um, using some of what I think she learned with Erin's team when she was at Berlin. So we're trying, I, I love that because it's allowing us to build some alignment across um, our schools. Um, 
the I will share that there has been some challenges for our staff, and I, I, I think this is probably true in all of all of theirs. And I don't have any staff member who's complaining or upset or feeling like this is a terrible place to be. I think they feel like this is exactly the right place to be and exactly the right work to be doing, but they want to do it well. And um, it's it, they're getting pulled in a lot of directions. And I think it's important for the board to know that the leadership team recognizes that and that we feel the support of the board and our staff. So thank you for that. When it comes to facilities at Calis, the um, I was joking, but not really joking in the port report when I said it's great when form and function and beauty all come together. The, if you haven't been out to Callis, and I know it's hard to come in the building, but even just walk up to the door and look underneath the, the portico, the lobby, there's like some beautiful cedar ceiling um, that has been put up underneath. The, it, we are a much more secure um, entrance into the building, which is, is great, but it looks great. We had some terrible rain and um, that sideways rain that always seems to find its way through our terrible old roof and ceiling tiles. I don't know how many times I've seen Floor walk into our building and say, hmm, cat, what about the, the ceiling tiles? Um, they're fixed, man. Thank you. The ceiling and the roof, rocking. The um, HVAC system is also underway. There are about four steps in the process, a little something to be done in September, October, November, and December. We are planning to go remote. So Cal's is feeling a fair bit of urgency to feel like we're really well prepared. Um, so anything that we can do to give our staff an opportunity to prepare is really important, but on our way. Thank you, uh, Principal Fair, and uh, uh, thank you for your leadership. And it sounds like Callis is rocking. So uh, uh, keep up the good work. Moving on to Dodie. Hey, uh, Dodie, I'd, I'd like to take some credit for it, but I really think that the lion's share of the credit belongs to the teachers who every day just step up in ways that are unimaginable. Um, everything about teaching has changed. Everything about what we know is effective and best practice is, I would say 90% of that is really no longer allowed under COVID, you know, the small group, the flexible grouping, all this kind of stuff that we do on a daily basis. So the teachers are consistently adapting, uh, as well as, you know, no, no, no joke, but teaching, getting a bunch of six and seven year olds to wash their hands for 20 seconds in an efficient fashion without water and soap going everywhere is no small feat. So I really feel like um, if anybody's gonna get credit for successful reopening, it, um, I'm, I'm really gonna deflect it all onto the teachers because they're really working hard. Uh, I think, you know, selfishly, um, the school closure was really boring. The, the job of being a principal is not really very much fun when there are no children in the building. So it's wonderful to have the kids and the kids are giving us endless sources of um, energy and amusement and just sort of reason for being there and getting things done. We're doing a lot at looking really flexibly and creatively, how do we do intervention? We have a number of students who have backslid over the closure, but we are just, uh, making getting kids the intervention services really our priority and we're seeing kids bounce back really nicely in terms of it's just a matter of being back in practice of being at school and just sort of really remembering what they forgot in a lot of situations so uh, that is going well in terms of facilities um, it's I did just recently send Bill Ford an email about the thingamajig that the guy from wherever he came from came and fixed today. But I think the big news is the siding and I really can't thank the board enough for their support with that. Uh, the exterior of Doty really finally matches the quality and the beauty of the education that happens inside the school. And my staff, is thrilled and I think it's given them a new sense of self-esteem 
and a little bit like, wait, we're really pretty now, so can't we have blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so <laughs> that's sort of fun. Um, we are doing some multi-tier systems of supports with the letters, the E and the M, I think I mentioned in my report, are having some challenges. So a couple of weeks ago, they had a reteach. Tomorrow, they're getting more specialized intervention services, and I'm hoping that that works. But basically, once those two letters decide to actually stick to the building, the envelope finished project will be finished. So thank you all sincerely. It, the, it has been just an absolute gift to have the building look and feel so good. Thank you, Principal Fuqua. And I just have a, uh, I have to say that uh, when I was reading the facility update, when you uh, submitted it, I had to chuckle a little bit because uh, that last, uh, and the second paragraph of the uh, facility update, you wrote, our new HRV unit is installed and operational. And uh, the funny story that no one, no one may know is I had literally not even set up my office yet. <laughs> and my phone rings. I, it's like the first day on the job and it's Gillian saying, Hello, I, I met you once before. I need an HRV. We need to get this immediately. We need to get this going. And I'm like, what is going on? You know, I just I just started like an hour ago officially, and I was very happy that uh, Gillian had spoken up because apparently, getting an HRV is like is like hitting the lottery. Uh, it's it's very hard to get, and it took almost seven weeks just to even get it into the into the into a Doty. So uh, you know, the school would not have been able to open if she had not called them like the first hour of me being a superintendent uh, in our district. So uh, just thank you for your leadership, Gillian. And uh, moving on uh, to Principal Leifert. Yeah, so I would echo um, much of what my colleagues have said, just so proud of the staff, so proud of um, the community that we live in and work in, um, just for rallying together, coming together. We have been incredibly fortunate with the weather. Um, I think we've had maybe one day a week each week where we can't be outside, but that has been it. Um, and that has been a true gift to not have to be in the building. Um, and we also have had plenty of time to practice what it looks like on those rainy days when we all have to be in the building all day and, and we've had a little taste of it. Um, but I think that, you know, we certainly, as a leadership team didn't plan to just have all of this glowing optimism and positivity in our report, but it was nice to hear that's how it came out because we were, you know, just being honest about the start to the year. Um, a couple of highlights at East Montpelier that I mentioned, and I'll go in a little bit more detail. One is our student leadership team of sixth graders that is up and running and going strong. Our announcements in the morning are happening. You know, they're doing the recycling and the composting and supporting um, the building and the teachers in ways that they have in the past and also in some new ways. We have them bringing out all of the recess equipment each day. They don't do any sanitizing or cleaning, but they do a lot of the heavy lifting um, and helping out, which has been a huge a huge help to the um, to the teachers and to the whole pr um, recess process that we have, which is quite a thing right now with pods. Um, the other thing that I'm just so proud of is our staff in the professional development. For years, our Wednesdays have been a professional development day from 8.15 until 4.45 every Wednesday. Um, and this year is no exception. So regardless of what's going on in the COVID world. Um, we're still learning and growing together as a staff. We have data teams that are up and running. Um, today, we did a, a formative assessment module together where we watched videos and read articles and participated in a protocol and discussion. Now more than ever, formative assessment is so important to see where our kids are at and where they're headed. Um, and then the other thing that I'm so proud of you know, regardless of COVID is we did some learning last spring together around our MTSS model. We used to have intervention blocks called reteach and we actually have gotten rid of them. And we have extended blocks of time for um, in the content area. So for math, literacy and writing um, and our interventionist 
support students during extended blocks rather than pulling them out. Um, and so that we started this year and I'm, I'm very pleased with the outcome so far. It's a lot of work um, and it means we have some of our teachers going into a lot of the pods and working with students from across the building, but um, we really felt like that would meet our students' needs um, in the best way and it, it's been going well so far. Um, the only other thing I would update, I, I have nothing to really update for facilities. We have an amazing facility. It's been beautiful and it continues to be beautiful. We did no work on it this summer, but the one thing I would say um, is we have had new students join us every single week of this entire fall. Um, so we are, we are bursting a bit at the seams and we're getting really creative with figuring out how to fit our students into classrooms. Um, and the most recent thing which has to do with facilities is we had beautiful rectangular tables in the past where kids could write all sit around and work together. Those are a thing of the past this year and we have um, moved to purchasing small individual desks and we've had to purchase them a number of times this fall because we keep um, growing. Um, so our classrooms look very different facilities wise than they have in the past and and kids are getting accustomed to it and they're they're doing well with it. Thank you, Ali. Uh, thank you, uh, Principal Lyford. I appreciate the uh, uh, the all the information about the uh, assessments and talking about MTSS and uh, the great facilities that you have. I, I will say I go to uh, I've been to East Montpelier a number of times and uh, every time I'm over there I get a very warm feeling uh, and you just know uh, something good is going on over there. So keep up the good work. And uh, now we move on to Principal Provost at Romney. Thank you. Uh, great to be here with everyone. Um, and I'm happy that the report was received with positivity and optimism. Um, that's that's a relief. Know that um, it doesn't underscore the daily challenges that um, our students, or not our students for the most part, our, our staff do such a great job working around obstacles and overcoming some challenges uh, for students. So I'm really thankful for the group of adults that we have who are working tirelessly to problem solve some really challenging um, some challenging situations for kids. Things are, are complicated some days and, and our staff is very dedicated in working through a, a lot of things. Um, as many of the other principals have mentioned, a number of things that we're also doing over at Remney. Um, really proud of the way that students have adapted to new routines. Uh, students have been really flexible every day. We remind them of the expectations and they do a great job with masks. They need reminders about keeping distance from other people. Um, they've learned how to wash their hands in interesting ways, and they have processes in different classrooms. So um, in many ways, the kids are, are doing very well, and they figured out how to, how to do this, again, with some reminders. Um, we are, this month, we're finishing up, like all of our schools, we're finishing up our fall assessment to get a better understanding of where kids, kids are at. Uh, the previous data that we're uh, referring to was from uh, early in 2020, so we weren't able to complete that in at the end of the school year. So we're trying to understand where students are at and where we need to help them to grow. Um, but all in all, things are, are working out okay. And as I mentioned in the report and I've uh, shared in our newsletters, uh, this, a big celebration for us is that we've been able to spend lots of time outdoors. Um, we borrow the, the, the Middlesex town property and we spend a lot of time out there. We have some tent spaces and we've had community members and staff members who have helped set out some great outdoor learning experiences. And uh, we have North Branch Nature Center working with us next week um, around how we can continue that into the winter. Um, regarding facilities this summer, we had uh, the sidewalk replacement project that was uh, completed. And um, in the, if you hadn't been to Romney in the winter, it was, uh, there were parts of the sidewalk that were uh, multiple inches above, above others. So it was not a safe place to be. So we're excited that we have a safe place to welcome kids and fam families at some point, uh, but our students and staff for right now into the building. Uh, we also have an acoustically sound gym and cafeteria that we look forward to welcoming students into someday. Uh, right now we're using the gym and cafeteria as a breakout space. Um, staff sometimes use that for planning and prep. We have meetings there as well, but 
it's not a traditional gym or cafeteria right now, but um, a lot of challenges, but a lot to be thankful for as well. And uh, thank you, Principal Provost, uh, for uh, uh, remaining upbeat despite these challenges. I know uh, it's been difficult across uh, the district and uh, across the state and across the nation from folks that I talked to about reopening, but uh, I know Romney in particular had a, a very, very, probably the most difficult opening of school that I've ever heard of before. And, uh, and I uh, just wanna give a shout out to that, that entire faculty and staff and community and Principal Provost for his leadership in uh, working, working through this. Uh, it's, that's probably one of the most difficult uh, openings I've ever heard of before. And I just wanted to uh, give you and your staff its due uh, because you definitely deserve it. Thank you. Uh, and last but certainly not least, Principal Dellinger Pate, we have uh, U32. I don't know this Principal Dellinger Pate guy, but <laughs> Principal Stephen, I'm pretty <laughs> up on. Um, we go by first names at U32. Um, so, um, so it's, uh, I would just, there's a big ditto to, um, to what you've heard from all of the elementary schools at U32. Um, really and truly, the, the best thing that I can say is that we have in this district um, one of the best staffs of uh, teachers and support personnel that you could ever hope for. And, uh, and, you know, it's one of those things where we stand on the shoulders of giants and they are doing such a good job of, of making our kids feel welcome, of really starting to educate kids in unique and, and um, a, a new opportunity. Uh, it's just amazing to see. I, I would offer that um, we've been setting goals with our teachers for their su supervision evaluation cycles. Um, and a lot of those meetings right now, the conversations that I'm having with uh, many of our high school teachers is um, how do we help kids be fully engaged in the learning process in a hybrid model? So what do we do when kids are remote? How do we make sure that they're able to continue with discussions? How are they able to do all these things? And I just, every teacher is so on top of this right now as to what can we do to make sure that no matter what our learning environment is, that the kids are able to learn, they're able to engage, and that they're able to thrive. And that's the part that I think is so important to, to stress right now. Um, I would say that since we wrote that report, um, a lot of the adrenaline at the beginning of the year is starting to wear off. And so you can start to see where people are, they're tired, um, but because they put so much energy and thought into getting this school year started. Um, and I think that we'll talk more about that at 3.7 as to how we can help some of our faculty but uh, I would just say that uh, overwhelmingly, the emails that I've gotten, the, the, the words that I've gotten is the community is pleased with what we're doing. They're happy that we have kids there and they're all nervous. Um, and so that's to be expected uh, across the board, but right now we're doing a great job. Facilities at U32, they're fantastic. Um, surprisingly, we finished the track um, this summer. I mean, it only took us a year and a half and an uh, entire, you know, COVID outbreak to get it done. Um, but if you haven't walked on our track or run on our track, it is a thing of beauty. It's like running on marshmallows now. So it's wonderful. Um, and so, so that's happened. We also finished up a bunch of concrete work in front of the school so that ours was even like uh, we had the same problem Romney had where it was just a, a very uneven sidewalk and, uh, and then did some work in the kitchen so that it's ready um, and, and able to get hopefully a hundred when we get our, um, our inspection here pretty soon um, as well. But uh, everything's going good at U32 overall. Um, it's just a great place to be right now. And so, you know, thanks to the board for your support and us getting ready this year. And thanks to the community for being here for us. And uh, just two things to follow up with, with uh, Stephen. I knew he was gonna say that to me after I already called Principal Fair. After I said, I knew it, he was gonna say it. Uh, the, the other thing is uh, just to give him a shout out with uh, and his uh, and his team and teachers. Uh, it was a uh, reason I was meeting with a group of teachers from a from and some of them were at the high school and uh, they did. I was talking about how the great work that uh, 
I get, I hear from parents and, uh, they, and one of them did mention to me that how much they appreciate hearing from their principal, the quotes of what some parents have told him because he shares it out with his uh, faculty. So uh, just giving him some feedback and uh, thanking him for his leadership and the U32 uh, staff and teachers. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you very much. This has to be one of the more invigorating leadership team reports that, that I can recall and uh, greatly appreciate it. Um, I, I don't want to uh, discourage board members from asking questions, but I do note the passage of time. And um, uh, also I, I note that um, next up on the agenda is scaling policy mountain here. Um, so are there, um, Jonas? Uh, I would, I, I would, <laughs> thanks Scott. Um, I'd love to hear, uh, from principal Fuqua about, uh, our seventh school in the district. Uh, we heard a little bit from Brian about, um, you know, the, the, you know, the remote teacher challenges, uh, but I'd love to hear from Gillian about how that's going and how the last couple of weeks have been uh, at the remote academy. Okay, so the remote school, you know, thank you, Jonas, because I, I did try to figure out where I fell on the alphabet and I lost it. Uh, so the, the remote school has, it's been a really interesting experience and has had a lot of growing and the challenges and things that we've come up have, we have been completely unable to predict. All the things that we thought were gonna be really hard have not even arisen. Um, and some of the things that we thought were gonna be really easy actually haven't been really easy, just sort of figuring out some of the endless stream of logistics. Um, I have an amazing team of teachers working, providing the remote elementary education. Every time I meet with them, I just honestly feel like the luckiest girl in the world because it's really a bunch of rock stars from around the district who are really just out there working to provide uh, and replicate the classroom experience in a remote environment. And they've been working on uh, figuring out assessments. We have figured out how to provide uh, intervention services for our remote students, how to adapt the MTSS system for remote students and the feedback from the teachers is really good. There are lots of hiccups and uh, I, it's a really great bunch to work with. And as far as I can tell, and Jonas can let me know, it seems like the kids are doing really well as well. Just a sample size of one, but yeah, it's going yeah. really well. You know, thank you. I, I really appreciate your asking that question, Jonas. Good one. Um, any others? If, if there are not any others, I might suggest that we just take five before we tackle the, um, the next bit. So um, back at 7.33, We, um, we just had a brief intermission, point of order type of thing, um, but we're back with uh, agenda, sorry, one moment, agenda item 3.4.1, um, the first reading for policies to be adopted on November 4th, 2020. Um, Chris, as policy committee chair, would you like to present these? I'm, I'm glad to do that. Um, and I would propose, since there are so many, uh, what I would propose to do is move them as a slate, uh, but then go through each one, name each one, and um, ask board members for any comments uh, on the individual policies. I will make that motion. So okay. Lindy moves. The policies as a slate. Uh, just point of clarification, though. What are we moving? Because isn't this our first reading of them? Yeah, I you're think we're. Right. Yeah. Right. So okay. you're, you're awesome. just moving it for review. I just I don't want to put forward a motion. No, they're not to be. They're not being adopted. Yeah. 
Yeah, not being, uh, you're absolutely right. We don't need a motion. I'm sorry. You're absolutely right, Diane. Okay, so well, I'm going to take um, that one to the bank. I don't hear that very often. Thank you. <laughs> I will say it at each meeting from now on. <laughs> so um, first up is um, policy um, C7, student attendance. Um, any comments or concerns? Um, hearing none. Uh, next um, is policy C20, which is student conduct and discipline. Any concerns or comments? Uh, before, Chris, before we move on, I, I just like to make sure that Jonathan, um, Jonathan Goddard has a chance to weigh in if, um, if he would like to. I'm not hearing anything. Um, or Stephen, look, Stephen, if um, if you're, if you have uh, anything, have any comments? I'll weigh in, Scott. Uh, sorry, Stephen, say that again, please. If I have any comments, I'll weigh in. Very good. Okay, thank you. All right, Chris, go right ahead. Um, next up is. Um, Policy C46, interrogation or searches of students by law enforcement or other non-school personnel. Okay, next up is a C49, kindergarten uh, entrance age. Okay, next up we have uh, policy D3, responsible computer, internet, and network use. Okay, next up we have um, policy D4, Title I comparability. Uh, next up, we have policy D5, uh, animal uh, dissection. Next up, we have policy D6, uh, which is and deals with class size. Just said, uh, Chris, Brian has his hand up. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to point, I, I, I know I've already kind of uh, broached this policy with the board uh, previously, but I just wanted to um, uh, just let you all know that uh, if you look at the implementation of this policy under number one, um, you know, it says the superintendent or his or her designee shall in consultation with building principals develop school-wide, district-wide class minimum and optimum average class size guidelines. Uh, you know, that, uh, just want you to be aware of that. So uh, it's up. It would be under this policy. It would be up to the uh, to me or my designee to uh, set the minimum and optimum class size, working with, in conjunction with the principals. Uh, I, it is my understanding that this has never been done before uh, as, in, in a policy level. Uh, I know that this policy is this. It's uh, all the districts throughout the state have some sort of class size policy. But just so you know that, and I know Lori. If Lori's you know, w w also I. I, it is my belief that setting such class size guidelines could have uh, budget uh, could, could impact the budget one way or the other, just so you're aware. Is that correct, Lori? Yes, um, we just have never really talked about minimums. We've always talked about maximums. And so I think when Brent and I reviewed this today, it became a question mark on this might be the first time that we set minimums and it could really change the way that we structure the budget. So. Just wanted to let you know, I don't think anyone has a copy of, of prior work that was done with a minimum class size, but we could not locate it in our office. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. 
Um, Chris, could I just ask a question? This one doesn't seem to be a BSBA model. Is was it based on anything from them? I actually think it is. Oh. Because this was not, I, I will tell you that this is not one that the policy uh, committee uh, created um, from scratch. Okay. It doesn't have all the little um, footnotes on it. So that's why I was asking. And, and I, I, if I might just jump in too, I think the references um, to sections 15 and 16 of Act 153 have since been codified in statute. Um, but um, of course I can't find it at the moment, but that might be something just to check, to have somebody check. And Scott, uh, we'll look into that. And if it has been, then I would propose that we amend the policy to be specific in terms of uh, the statute so it's easily found. That sounds For great. next time. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Just making myself a note. I just a point of clarification. Uh, Chris, will you be looking into that piece or would uh, you I will want look, the- uh... I'll look into that. Okay, I great. will look Thank into you. that. Great. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Um Okay, so next up is E1, Title I, Parental Involvement Compact. Chris, could you just describe what the intent of this is? You know, I think it's, um, I'm going to ask, is Kelly with us? You know, Jonas, it's a, it's a policy that just came to us. And go ahead, Brian. Yeah, yeah uh, I've, I've worked in districts with uh, parental involvement compacts. Uh, the idea typically, it's a, it's typically comes out of a, a Title I, I believe, uh, uh, Grant, I see Jen, Jen's ready to uh, jump in as well, but uh, from what I understand, uh, there's the Title I, you come up with a way of uh, defining expectations for the school and for working together with families, uh, and you come up with uh, talking about ways to improve student achievement, school performance, how, what are some ways and strategies that parents and, and uh, staff and students can work together to improve achievement. Jill, uh, Jen, do you have uh, additional yeah, I would just add it's um you know as recipients of federal funds, Title One monies in particular, we have to sign off on assurances, um, all sorts of things, and this is one of them. So it's a requirement that we have a Title One comparability policy and a Title One parental involvement policy with a compact. Um, this was something that we hadn't had in place when I came on board, and we had the um, really pleasure of having a program monitoring visit that first year that I was in the position in 2012-13. It was a finding for us, and we remedied it. So um, we have the policy, we have the compacts, and um, we have not re-examined them since then. So that was something that um, we could take a look at now, given our time and circumstances now to see, but our principals ensure that they are in handbooks and or posted on the school websites each year. Thanks, Jen. Thank you very much, Jen. Any other comments or questions? Um, next up, we have E45, the role of religion in our schools. And our final consideration is uh, E, I'm sorry, F1 travel reimbursement. Okay, so um, next uh, board meeting, the uh, policies will be moved as a slate uh, for adoption. Uh, the, from based on the conversation tonight, I'm sorry, Go ahead, Jonas. Jonas, um, does F1, does there need to be some kind of language in there that this doesn't 
covered, you know, basic commuting? Um, I think that is probably covered in the Mm. Brian, I would think I, I think it could be covered by the prior approval from the superintendent or designee uh, will be required. And I think there's the C. It says for school business and commuting to and from work isn't for school business. That's to get you to work. You know, you can, someone can make that argument because if you, but you're right. Should we will add a clarif clarification that says this is not intended to reimburse any employee for traveling, for commuting to and from work. And in, in the case of a mid-year transfer, you know, we've talked about, you know, we've talked, yeah, I, I see Brian nodding, right? So that, that would require superintendent approval, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Okay, thank you. Wonderful, many thanks everybody. So uh, are we ready then to move on to Kari's domain, education quality? Kari, would you like to take over? Sure, so um, page 41 is the um, performance report. This is an FYI item. And um, I believe it's a relatively new report that's required annually by the state regarding special ed standards. And the committee had the opportunity to discuss it in early October. You'll see in the report that there's um, there's mixed results. There's some positive for sure, and there's some areas where we're not meeting the target. For example, the first couple are uh, the graduation rate for students on IEPs and the dropout rate, and some others. And um, we talked a little bit about implications of this and it, basically what this is saying is that the, um, the district needs to improve in these areas and assistance is offered um, in, in, our, in these first, the first year. Um, it's voluntary whether we take a, advantage of the trainings and other kinds of assistance. Um, two years, I believe, would require, it would be required if we were non-compliant. Um, so I, I take it from um, uh, staff's report, specifically Kelly Bushy's report, that there's optimism about this and the appreciation for the uh, supports that are offered by the state to help with um, the strategies to improve in these areas. So that's what I've got. Do board members have any questions? Brian? And I just know that uh, Kelly had uh, prepared a uh, presentation to go over some of this with uh, the board tonight, just so you're aware of this report and to give you more background about this report. And we get this every year. This is a two year lag. So we, you know, we're, this is from 2018. So, and again, it's a glimpse in time, but uh, Kelly did prepare a report, uh, a presentation, a short presentation to the board tonight. Sure, yeah. I think, I mean, Kari summed it up pretty well, but I'm happy just to review. I summarized it in a different way, actually, since the Ed Quality Committee saw it, only because I've been to a training since we were last together. And um, so I broke down the presentation in a little different structure. Um, and I'm happy to take a few minutes and go over that, so if that's what folks would like me to do. Yes, okay. All right, so first of all, what is the annual performance report? So this is actually only one component of the, the general supervision that comes out of the Agency of Education, um, specific to special education. Um, uh, every three years, every school district is in a cycle um, that folks from the AOE do some on-site monitoring where they come in and actually look at some of our special ed paperwork, um, our policies and procedures, and next year is our turn for that yet again. Um, and it does seem as every three years that process change and changes and looks quite different, but um, this is only one sort of prong in that puzzle. And so in the report, you'll see that there are 14 indicators um, and they group these together in terms of um, special ed compliance. And then I just put in parentheses here the which ones represent compliance within the special ed rules and regs. 
and then the other is around results, so assessment data. Um, and so to share with you this evening, I broke it down within the compliance and the results sections to show you how we're doing. Um, so in terms of special ed compliance, we are actually meeting all of the state targets in all of those areas except for indicator 13. And if folks have questions about what these indicators mean, I'm happy to um, do my best to explain them. Some of them are a little complicated. Um, but indicator 13 is the transition plans. And so students who in the year in which they turned 16, um, there's a new section in the IEP where we talk about life after high school and set some targets and some goals um, to work with the student on what their interests are um, in terms of what they wanna pursue after high school. Um, I will say that this is actually um, one of the areas in which not a single school district across the state of Vermont met the state target. And so this is a very um, concentrated effort this year. Um, yesterday, uh, I attended a training that the AOE put on specific to transition plans. And I know that Julia Pritchard, our director at U32 has uh, earlier in the year went to a training and she actually just presented to the U32 special educators last week um, that I joined her in that. And so this is an effort that, you know, she'll not, she and I will be um, working together on this year um, repeatedly and over time um, to support the special educators so that we can um, make sure that we are, you know, doing what we need to do for the kids in this area. So in terms of results, um, this is, you know, outcomes for students. Um, again, um, I have to move my camera here. So we did meet um, criteria um, around the proficiencies for children um, on IEPs and their reading assessments. And in terms of the school age LRE, so um, we're actually above the state target in terms of including kids in, our, in the general ed setting. So in the least restrictive environment. Um, and we are meeting the target in terms of the number of students that we send to alternative programs. And again, we are above the state average. You'll recall that um, just uh, two years ago now, or in year three, we have created some continuums of supports on campus. We have our own in-house alternative program. And so um, that's, that's uh, helping us in this effort as well. And then in terms of parent involvement, so parents, um, receive surveys. So parents of students on IEPs receive surveys on an annual basis in terms of how they are included and involved in the special ed process. And um, we are meeting the state targets. We're actually above the state above the state average in this area as well. And then, as Kari had mentioned, we did not meet the state targets in terms of our graduation rate and our dropout data. Um, and then in terms of the percentage of students who participate in reading and math assessments. And again, I gave an example last time um, in the 2018-19 school year, we had students, we had 148 students eligible to take the SBAC assessment in grades three through eight. So that's uh, 148 students on IEPs in, in that grade range. And four of those students for one reason or another, right? Could be a medical exemption, could have been a you know, longer um, absentee period of time, but four of those students did not participate and that caused us to not meet that state target. Um, and then the percentage of students proficient in math, we also did not meet that target. Um, and then the last one was around the percentage of triple E students, so this is our preschool kiddos um, that are eligible for special ed, uh, receiving services in our programs, right? So if we have um, students that are eligible that might go to childcare centers outside of our district or who are at, you know, stay at home and come in for services. Um, and so this is saying that, you know, we are providing service, not, an, not enough of our triple E students are enrolled in our programs is essentially what that means. Uh, oops, 
So what does this mean for us? Just this overall summary of the data. Um, we are at a 72% um, and anywhere, you know, in the needs or needs assistance range is from 60 to 79%. So we are in year one, it's called cyclic monitoring. And as Kari had mentioned, there are lots of opportunities that the state will be providing that are strictly voluntary for us this year. Um, and, you know, obviously I'm gonna jump into as many as I can to get smart about it. So help us try to avoid uh, being in year two of this when things are no longer choices. Um, and then, you know, if this is an ongoing systemic issue, um, this, the agency of ed could come in and, um, you know, force our hand to do many other things. And so, um, and this next slide here, just to give you some perspective around how things are looking across the state, I did link here the Vermont Digger article that was um, written in the fall um, when this report was first released about special ed in the state overall. Um, and as a state, we're in needs assistance, right? And so this information, you know, that's specific to Washington Central contributes to that overall state data. Um, but you'll notice here that there are 16 districts or SUs that are in the meets requirement and a majority of us are in the needs assistance. Um, and then just sort of a what's next. Again, some of this again was updated since the Ed Quality Committee. Um, you, know, you know, reviewing this with our special educators, talking about it with them and understanding what this means. Um, I will, I plan to participate in voluntary trainings. There's one coming up next week. And then Julia and I will be working together on indicator 13. And I mentioned earlier, there's been a training just last week and that will continue to be working with our special educators at U32 to make this a focus of our work. Um, and then we'll just continue to be also involved in, you know, the continuous improvement process and ensuring that special ed voice is heard um, in, in all of those conversations. Questions, comments? Anybody have anything for Kelly? Uh, this is Steve Look. Please, Stephen. Um, but more an observation that I, th I, th I think we need to continue to work to have the entire district and all the employees in the district understand that improving the performance of any particular cohort, so in this case, students that um, are receiving some form of special education is is a obligation of the entire um, I, I I just don't want to I don't want the board to feel like okay there's a special ed group and the special ed group handles this stuff um, everyone handles this stuff to me it's the same thing as race it's the same thing as gender you don't have a special group that's in charge of, well, you do have a special group for special ed. But for me, that should be because of the technicalities and the legalities in providing specialized support. I think it's important um, as a board member that um, I impress upon everyone that it's everyone's responsibility to help these students, not just special educators. Thank you, Stephen. Understood. Yeah. Thanks, Stephen. Um, Jonas, uh, Kelly, what's the what's the best indicator here? What's the what's the indicator you know of this list of indicators? What's the one you're most proud of, um, and what's going to be the hardest one to get from a no to a yes? Um, I think in terms of the district as a whole, I think the least restrictive environment is one that I'm very proud of because we work really hard to keep all of our kids in the general ed setting as much as possible. And that it shows here that that effort is paying off. And it does go back to what Stephen was saying that that's an all hands on deck, everybody 
everybody has to be in it for that to happen and to support our most, our most vulnerable kids. And then the one that's gonna be the most challenging to turn around, is that what you, um, I would say probably the graduation rate simply because that data and the way in which it's calculated to me feels incredibly arbitrary, right? Here at U32, we have an outstanding transition program. So for our kiddos in that age 18 to 22 bracket, um, where we're working on independent living skills, um, workforce, you know, work habits and types of, you know, for students that have um, intensive needs. And because they don't graduate in that four year cohort, we get dinged in that data. And so, you know, they have an, you know, there's an entitlement that they can be here in school till the age of 22 as they're working on those life, you know, goals. Um, and because that's an opportunity that we have that you really, um, does not support us in this, in, in, you know, increasing this data, if that makes sense. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, anyone else? Okay. Kelly, many thanks. And <laughs> Kari as well. Um, shall we continue then on to 3.6, Finance Committee? Floor? Uh, were we going to do the, I don't have the agenda right in front of me. Were we going to do the education in the quality to carry the, the goal or that's for later? Do we miss? That, that's later. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So moving into finance, we had, a, we had a meeting just before the meeting. And Lori, are you with us? Yes, I see you. And, and Lori uh, shared with us uh, several highlights. So I was wondering, Lori, if you could, if you wouldn't mind just going by that first page uh, just quickly on to give us the highlights. 47. So if everyone could go to page 47. Um, this month, we did a huge uh, payroll update. It's been several months of worth of work. We began in May um, updating employees' contracts and their personal benefit elections and comparing that to the budget. Um, what you'll see tonight is a culmination of all that hard work and um, the principals helped with that. I had acknowledged in the report four employees in our office who had also worked so hard um, because we've had so much staff turnover and vacant positions We've had negotiations settle late. And the four, four employees that we were recognizing were Carla Messier, Virginia Breer, um, Michelle Sepka, sorry, and um, Melissa Tuller. They've worked together to make sure that employees were paid in a timely manner uh, during this complicated time. So having said that, there's still 11 positions that are vacant right now. Um, we put in the projections uh, an estimate based on, you know, history for those positions, uh, but this update will be taking place again in January due to the benefit enrollment opportunity that staff have. So it's not like the last time you're going to see it. Um, we update it quarterly. And again, I work with each principal and tomorrow, uh, beginning tomorrow, Brian and I are meeting with each principal to kind of go through this level service staffing and roll up a budget draft for your next meeting. So having said that, what's not included is the special ed staffing um, changes because of the service plan. So we're gonna double check all that in the next two days as well. Um, I've listed quite a few changes, um, but at the end of the day, what you're going to see is that we are expecting to save $410,000 in staffing this year. Um, it's based on the fact that we did not fill some positions and the, the positions that we haven't filled, I'm going to list those, they're on page 49. Um, we did not fill two instructional coaches. Um, as I noted in the report, district employees were offered those positions um, and respectfully declined because they felt their time might be better served in the classroom due to the epidemic here. Uh, so next year, we're gonna be posting those again and hopefully um, we'll have a new turn of events so that we can fill those two district-wide coaching positions. We did use a little bit of the savings for some um, professional development and some supplies. 
Um, we also have not filled a full-time U32 food service position. We're still not 100% sure whether or not we'll need to fill that mid-year. Um, but if you consider the fact that we have about 200 less students in the building uh, due to the on and off week for the high school, um, somehow Brian Fisher has been able to pull this off with the current staffing he has. The other position we haven't filled is the 0.6 U32 social worker. And in talking to Stephen, we didn't anticipate filling it this year. We're going to have the conversation whether or not that position will be in the budget next year. Um, we did add a full-time special ed social worker this year. And so we'll be discussing, you know, you know how this is all gonna tie together. So in total, that sums up to 3.6 FTEs and the other 0.4 Scott Thompson mentioned um, was for preschool assistants that have slightly different hours um, due to the scheduling. So that covers the staffing. Um, as far as revenue changes, um, we were unable to have um, potential tuition students shadow at U32 this spring due to the closure of school. So we believe that that's the reason why we've lost four students um, and primarily they're from Orange, the town of Orange. So hopefully um, this cycle will improve for the coming year where we can have in-person um, student shadowing. Um, but on a good note, um, the small schools grant um, has come in almost 29,000 higher. Um, I, sorry, I forgot to quantify the loss of those four students is almost $83,000. So at the end of the day, everything is going well. Um, the net impact to fund balance is a projected uh, surplus of about 357,000. Um, the CARES relief fund is still up in the air and by the next meeting, I really do expect to have a better update for you. Um, we have been given a verbal um, on our grant request. I've submitted a lot of different expenses um, that we haven't really been able to validate. For example, I put in a lot of money in that request for cleanings of the schools. Um, I need to go back through and confirm how much of that is really happening and how much was just an estimate on the part of my application. So. Uh, um, as far as the construction projects go, that's on page uh, 52. And the capital fund is projected to have $1.2 million left. Uh, 906 of that was, 906,000 um, was from the East Montpelier uh, fund that was established prior to the merger. 117,000 is for the central office capital fund that was established prior to the merger. And 182,000 is the Washington Central Unified Union balance that I'm currently projecting. Um, the projects are still not finished, um, but when they do, I'll, I'll have final numbers in the next, I think, few, few weeks. So we're looking forward to putting together a budget draft for the next meeting. And I think that covers the highlights floor. Did I miss something, Flora, Brian? No, I think those were those were all the highlights. I guess the, the one thing that we did talk about so people don't think we forgot on the transition for the business administrator and we would have something to share at the next meeting as far as job description. So it's, uh, we're working on it. And uh, I think just to reiterate, you, you did a great job, uh, uh, Lori. Thank you. The uh, just uh, I don't know if we mentioned food service. Uh, it was extended through June 30th. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Yep. That's true. And, and, and we had that question. They're looking into how to get more kids to take advantage of the food service. Do we talked a little bit about that and just to make sure that everybody is taking advantage of it. And, and fortunately, the towns at least is setting a good example. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah. So um, are, are we good then on the financial report portion. Anything else, Fleur, in that domain? Uh, do we want uh, questions from board members, if board members have any, for Lori or for Fleur? Sounds like not. Should we continue then? So, uh, Fleur, would you like to um, take the lead on this, uh, sorry, on the curriculum review bit? Yes. So the finance committee 
review, the curriculum review uh, with, uh, with Brian and Kari and Chris McVeigh today. And we are recommending to, to the board that we move ahead. We made a motion to suggest to all of you that we move ahead with uh, getting a bid, continuing this effort and getting a bid, which would be really just getting more information for the board to make a decision. Uh, we had a, a pretty long discussion about uh, about the what, what this means for our district, and I will let really Brian uh, speak to that. Or first, depending on timing, Scott, I don't know how you want to do this because it's eight o'clock already. If people had uh, time uh, to read to read that, if they have specific questions, or how, how about if we make like a, a motion a motion to approve? Um, proceeding with the bid and um, with the bid process and then we can have discussion of the motion and have the vote. Does that sound right? Sure. Um, so uh, how about a motion then to um, go ahead with the bid process for the curriculum review? I'll move. Jonas, I'll second it. Jonas. Jonas moves, floor seconds. Thank you. All right, um, open for discussion. Uh, uh, maybe Brian first and then Diane. Yeah. Yes, so I, uh, then... oh, sorry. Sorry, Scott. You're good, Brian, you're okay. good. Yeah, so I, uh, uh, when I did, uh, just let everyone know, I did send out a, uh, a communication to staff uh, the other day uh, to let them know that uh, the board was interested in uh, looking at looking at this uh, uh, I, uh, process, the uh, and possibly using this information to uh, inform the strategic planning process after uh, you know, once we get through um, looking at uh, conducting this uh, curriculum management review. I am also going out to schools to uh, meet with teachers and staff to talk to them. I've met with the leadership team uh, individually, principals twice, and the entire leadership team once to discuss this. Uh, this plan, there have been, and then I've also, uh, we also talked about doing something like this in our equality piece and in the, uh, in our board retreat, there have been about three questions that I have received uh, that have been common themes, common questions. So I can try to answer some, answer them now so that I, that I know fit just so folks are aware. Uh, one of the things was budget. You know, we were looking at a budget. I know uh, we just went over the budget piece uh, right, we went. Uh, Lori just went over the budget, and and I know it's continuing to continuing to evolve. Uh, but the uh, one thing is, how are we going to pay for this? Uh, well, we first of all we need to get a bid to figure out how much it's going to cost. But we do think uh, in my in studying what other districts uh, around the country and uh, and have used for for the uh, a curriculum management review cost, uh, we believe we could pay that in grant funding. We might be able to do that, but we won't know until we actually put the bid out. Uh, the other questions was, well, have we done other types of audits or, re re or reviews before? Uh, Vermont does do an integrated field review. Uh, this would be this would be something that would complement the integrated field review. Uh, it would also uh, it, Washington Central has always been kind of a leader in take in, in, in a, pay, a pace make, a pace setter in uh, doing these. Uh, types of reviews and then developing some sort of a plan around the review of what we learned from. Uh, and so we're, we're hoping to uh, build on that. And then again, uh, there was a question about, you know, we're in a pandemic, why are we uh, doing this? Or what, or if we do pick, pick people to come into our district, um, we'll, we'll, is that safe? Are we gonna be able to do that? And so ultimately I think we would have to know who the vendor is if we end up selecting a vendor uh, and trying to figure that figure that out, uh, who that would be, uh, and making sure we work with them, or even including that in the bid process, that uh, you would have to they they would have to uh, qualify with either doing uh, remote options for the for doing the review, a hybrid model, an in person piece. Uh, so there's definitely different ways of doing it. Uh, and the one and the other question that came with it was. Um, is it, is it gonna be a, a tough, uh, a lot of extra work for teachers? It's not supposed to be any extra work for teachers. They have enough to do with, th this is uh, really just an opportunity uh, for the district to get an idea, a sense of what is our processes and procedures at the district level, at the systems level, and also looking at instructional trends. 
Thanks, Brian. Diane and then Lindy. Uh, my question is, you know, as looking at the timeline, uh, will we be sure to put some language in there that should we be delayed due to COVID that um, you know, it either pushes it out or that there are safeguards in there? Uh, that's a great question, Diane. We were at, we actually, I was actually literally talking about that with uh, Lori and our finance committee. Lori, can you uh, answer that one? Is she still there? <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I didn't know I was going to get called on. Um, so and just so you know, I have popcorn. <laughs> So <laughs> anyway, um, so I'm sorry. Um, so what what we've done in the past was we've had some contracts that we've learned from this past spring with regard to students. And one of the things we've we've had legal counsel advise us on is some of the wording to use so that things do move along and that we're only paying for what we get. So we would definitely want some of those clauses incorporated in a final contract. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> That's great. Um, thanks. Lindy? Um, yeah, I read the kind of description of the timeline and um, asking for a bid. And I couldn't really make out what it is you're asking for in this curriculum review to know um, it, it just was it could go from $5 to $50,000, depending on what we're asking, maybe even more, I don't know. But I I am a skeptic. I'll just put it right out there. So I think um, understanding better what it is you're asking for in that description was my one of my concerns. Thanks, Lenny. Brian? Yeah, I know uh, on page 55, we do have the statement of needs. Uh, and the idea was to get an idea of uh, uh, look, looking at the curriculum assessment and instructional practices in pre-K pre to 12 and, con and all content areas. Uh, we want to look for someone who has uh, conducted curriculum and instructional practice review slash audits before. Uh, we want to, I mean, it's, it's all in here from eighth. I don't want to have to read through all of them, but if uh, but they're in here, kind of looking at instructional practice across our district to evaluate the status of curriculum within each content area and making sure it's, uh, when they look at it, it's looking at, and, it, and here's an important point I wanna point out too, uh, Lindy, is it making sure it's relative to the Vermont and national standards and our student learning outcomes. So the idea is that, you know, we're looking for someone who's gonna work with our local, like this, this is what the leadership team and the teachers and this district have committed themselves to with the student learning outcome piece. And so, the idea is we want to make sure we get someone that comes in here is not going to say we don't believe in student learning outcomes we want you to do something no we, we want them to make sure they work within our local our local context and so uh, uh and, and i think the idea is is this I'm, i would be looking for someone who is um very supportive of local control uh and i think that i, I end up and, and I know that we, we just had Kelly go over the local annual performance report and you know, what happens when you don't make certain things and the state starts off with these little, you know, you're going to do trainings and then you're going to do this. And before you know it, they're telling us a lot more to do things. So I think the idea really is how do we make sure that we meet these uh, performance requirements from the state, but also uh, keep our own processes and keep our own local pieces like the student learning outcomes and uh, being able to make sure it's uh, our, our content in uh, different uh, grade, area, grade level areas are vertically articulated and are horizontally aligned uh, across grade levels. So, so I think uh, across grades, across schools. So I think that's really a lot of the, uh, the part of it, but you know, we're asking them to come in and, and give us a, a, a better idea of what we're doing and what, we're, what, we, where, what are some areas that we could go into and then get that report. And my vision for using this report uh, I think uh, aligns with uh, the board's vision, uh, as we had discussed in our retreat, to include all stakeholders. So now that we get a document, how do we, um, you know, we're not doing something where we're going to throw out the baby with the bathwater. You know, that, that that's not the plan of this at all. Uh, the idea is, you know, how do we strengthen what we've already been doing and uh, what are some ways that we can learn, you know, maybe identify some areas that we are, we're not aware of. Uh, and how, do we, how can we tackle those? And then using that in the strategic planning process. Sorry, that was a mouthful, but. 
no, that was that was very helpful. And how far or wide or whatever the net is going to be thrown out to get people because the education world can be very polarized on and we put a lot of money into professional development yeah. and training and all the work they did in picking the math curriculum in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of things are just the SLOs, keeping all that in mind is very important to me. Ab absolutely. And, uh, and, I, and I hear you loud and clear, Lindy. It's very important to me as well. Uh, there's uh, some really great things happening here in the district and uh, we need to build upon them, not, uh, not remove them, in my, it's my, in my opinion. Thank you very much. Uh, Floor, is that a raised hand or? Yeah, actually, I was not sure, but I'm just going to say that we had a little bit of a discussion and I just want to say it in the bigger, uh, because I didn't find the right words, but we, uh, Brian was uh, open and the rest of the board to, uh, I, I don't want to lose sight of when we're doing this curriculum review. I know that it's more for aligning uh, standards, but also to do it with the lens on equity and uh, how culturally responsive or I don't know, accuracy to historical events, it comes later, you know, that's more content, but how can we put an equity uh, lens in, in maybe that's a spot that we're missing within our, uh, our not strong enough in our SLOs, for example. So just to throw that out there, especially if we're gonna have somebody uh, reviewing what we're doing right now. Thanks, Laura. Um, are there other are there other comments or concerns, questions? If not, are we ready to go to a vote? Uh, in favor of Jonas's motion seconded by Fleur to approve the um, proceeding with the, the curriculum review bid. Please click yes. If you're opposed, click no. Aye. And Chris says aye. Chris still, I say aye also. And, and Jill, are you? Uh... Oop, I said I heard aye. Jill I say aye. Aren't working. Yeah. Uh, Jill said aye. Okay, sorry. Um, I'm seeing yeses and no noes. Great. I have nine yeses and, uh, well, plus Jill and Chris, which would make 11 and no noes. So, um, 11 zero, the motion carries. Thank you very much, everyone. Good. Um, now uh, we move on to board operations, board goals, board governance oh, no. goal. Oh. Um, sorry. Oh, no, no. I, I, I take that back. Um, we're at 3.7, the agenda, re the revised agenda. Yes. Um, thousand apologies. School year calendar change request. There it is. Yes. So uh, the request is, uh, we, uh, is we have, I met with the leadership team today. Uh, you know, they have a really good pulse of our teachers and, uh, you know, I rely upon them to advise me. Um, and uh, we had talked about, we had a long uh, discussion uh, earlier today uh, about how we can support our teachers, how we can support our, our communities. And uh, you know, one of the big conversations that's going on across the state right now is as a uh, the some school districts are talking about you know how can they add more days and add more time to their kids uh, coming to school in person. I think our conversation is how do we keep our schools open uh, for our children uh, it, it, as long as we you know these infection rates aren't uh, don't change and, and we talk, we already talked about the thresholds and everything else. Uh, and I think there were a, a few things. Uh, first of all, um, you know there was some concern about teachers burning out, staff burnout. Right, that's a big piece. Uh, and the other piece was, what happened if we go remote, like tomorrow, would we be prepared? And I think the idea is, well, having the experience of last year and having Canvas, and we, we would be in a better spot. Uh, however, it also, uh, it became apparent 
to the um, uh, our, our, everyone in our leadership team, we're talking about it that we think some of our, we think uh, uh, while our teachers would do a great job, we feel that they would need some more help uh, in getting prepared with the Canvas piece. Uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, things that they're learning. We've you know, even though you go to all these trainings, you know, you know we had we had all these trainings in the beginning of the year. We front loaded it, and that was the right thing to do. Uh, for teachers and giving them opportunities to uh, get ready. There's still a lot more work th that they have to learn about uh, and build their capacity in the Canvas. So uh, the ask right now is to have, an early, have early release days on November 4th and November 18th. And that's, the, that's the, uh, what we're asking um, uh, for the board tonight. So we can start notifying families and notifying our teachers and letting them know uh, we, we really want to make sure we support our teachers. I, I, I said it last board meeting, I'll say it again. Uh, without teachers, we don't have we don't have schools. I mean, we don't have classrooms, we have empty classes. And so uh, we just feel like this is this will be necessary to make sure our teachers have more time to prepare in the event that we have to go remote. Uh, and also, uh, you know, this is probably something we may have to also continue to revisit um, as uh, we get closer to the holiday season. Uh, and, you know, we may have to consider, you know, adding more days for teachers to uh, have these uh, you know, early release days uh, at some point in the, later in the year, if it's necessary. Thanks, Brian. Brian, would you like to um, give us the language, the precise language for the motion you'd like us to um, consider? Yes, um, and, uh, and I saw Stephen with his hand up. I don't know if I wanna give Stephen a chance to add any more to it. Just, oh. just a reminder that this is not high school. Um, oh, yes, yes. Doing a hybrid model with high school, we need them in as much yeah. time as possible. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's element, it's, it's basically pre-K through um, um, middle school. And so the, the, uh, the language would be, uh, the proposal would be to the board approve uh, early release, changing the 2020-21 school year calendar to add early release days for elementary and middle school middle schools on November 4th and November 18th. Thanks. L Lisa, did you get that? Yes, thanks. Okay, now who would like to move that and second it? I so move it, Diane. Okay, Diane moves. Floor, was that a second coming on? Okay. I was trying to give another person a chance, but yes. Okay, so <laughs> Diane moves, Floor seconds. Um, open for discussion. Diane. Go ahead. So I just wondered, um, and I maybe I missed it, but when you say early release, what is the time that, I mean, is it fully closed or is there a time of day they're leaving? I'll let uh, Principal Lightford, uh, we were talking about that today, I'm gonna put you on the spot. <laughs> so. Yeah, so this is something we've done in the past um, for inclement weather. We have specific times. So in order for a st school day to count, students must <laughs> be in school through lunch. Um, so at U32, I believe dismissal is 11.30, and at the elementary school's dismissal would be at 12.30. <clears throat> Thanks. <coughs> Pardon me, Lindy? What right now are you still having the Wednesday <clears throat> early release? What is the schedule right now that's going on? Uh, uh Right now, the uh, I'll let, I think you're asking what other days do we have early, early release in November? Is that is that? No, I remember on Wednesdays there's been early release when oh. for the last few years. Is that happening now? What's happening right? Now? Yeah, Alicia, you want to? Yeah, so so um, as in past years, U32 dismisses at two o'clock on Wednesdays, and the elementary schools dismiss right around three o'clock. Give or take a few minutes on either side. Thank you. Um, any other, uh, Brian? And I just wanna say that you know, this is, 
we're obviously we're we're trying. This will help us in November, but we we this is going to be something we're going to have to continue to monitor uh, to support our staff and our teachers. Uh, and again, we're also I'm I'm also waiting additional information and guidance from the AOE uh, regarding the holidays and remote what 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 we may have to consider during the holidays with holiday travel. Uh, there's different um, schools of thought around that, so I'm waiting to hear uh, more information uh, in the next several days. Great, um, thank you. So, um, are we ready to move to a vote then on changing the school calendar to have early release on November 4th and November 18th? As um, moved by Diane and seconded by Flora. If so, please click yes if you're for, no if you're against, and uh, or say aye if you don't have access. And it um, seems that all yeses, I have 11 here. Um, so thank you, everyone. The motion passes. I, I noticed we've hit 8.30. Um, is there, would people like a break or would you like to just, oh, sorry, Brian, go yeah, ahead. I, it, regardless if we go, we go to a break or not, I just wanna uh, just say uh, thank you for doing that. And I wanna thank the leadership team uh, for uh, speaking up on, on behalf of all the teachers. Uh, and, and I just wanted to also say that, you know, it's 8.30 and I would like to send my, my folks home to go to bed for the, the day because we can, we, we will continue, but the uh, principal's got a long day tomorrow in the morning. They got to be up early um, and as does my central office staff. So if that's okay, no matter what we do, I'd like to send them home. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, they can stay if they want, home. but you know, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, if they, if they have unusual taste in entertainment, they're welcome to stay. <laughs> but, um, otherwise, uh, with our thanks and, um, and respect, uh, please go enjoy the rest of your evenings if that's what you prefer to do. Thanks. So um, board members, uh, do you want to break or do you want to plow through? Um, thumbs up on a break or uh, how about if you need to go, just go and um, we won't do anything super important if too many people are not here. Um, but <clears throat> we can then move on to, uh, I believe, unless I'm forgetting something again, um, board operations, 4.1 board goals, first item board governance goal. Um, Floor, uh, yeah. would you like to go? Sure. So we we had a we had a meeting with the Mike committee, and we are working on a, in a, I, w I was planning on sharing it on the screen, but I think it's considering time. A, a, I, I'm not gonna share it right now, but we're working on a on a board manual a, that takes care of that first part that we were looking uh, to achieve, uh, which is the norms. This is gonna be a collaborative uh, document that I'm hoping we can schedule uh, blocks of time for us uh, to work to work with you. We, I would like to just be able to send that framework uh, to everybody. That's sort of what we agreed on our little committee uh, to be able to, to see it and we would start uh, populating that document. And then the second part of our uh, of our meeting uh, for uh, for board governance was uh, trying to establish getting some some achievable goals. So the most important uh, that we're going to do tonight really is on the executive session part of it, which is the other goal that we can would take considerable amount of time. So um, and and then we also have this quality, uh, the student achievement goal that I want us to have enough time to do. So if if we as we, we could concentrate on that part of the executive uh, session as our board uh, governance goal for today, if that's okay with everybody. Uh, that's what I was planning on, uh, unless we have, what do you think? Thumbs up or, yeah. Okay. So then that's it for, for me. I'll give it back to you, Scott. Thank you, Flora. 
Great. And um, I think at this point, we have the student achievement goal that you can find on page 57. And Kari, if I'm not mistaken, this is your baby. Okay, thanks. Um, so uh, page 57. Um, so the committee has uh, is recommending two goals and we're drawing on our discussions at the retreat as well as some prior committee work and the charge that the board approved and then um, additional discussion with Brian and Jen um, and the committee. So start with the first goal is really about this system for board to review the student learning and achievement. And um, I, I think you've seen this concept before, but the idea of using um, the student learning outcomes and defining a calendar, there's a draft in the, in the goal. Uh, and then, and really just systematically working our way through each of the outcomes to better understand um, both what our efforts are as a district to um, um, deliver this, this um, education, and then also what are the outcomes? How is it actually going for the students? And so the, the model here is that the committee will go in depth and we'll bring our findings to the board for discussion. So the, the committee usually meets the first uh, Wednesday of the month and then the second uh, board meeting of the month, we would bring you our findings and, and um, um, structure a way to have some discussion about that to go um, that's appropriate at the board level. And really the goal here is for us as a board to become more proficient in our, in our knowledge and our use of the information about student achievement. So this is you know, central to our mission as a district and it's um, it, the practical part of this is that it, with time as we become proficient, we can use it as the basis for planning and for budgeting and for community engagement. So um, should I pause there, see if there's any comments or questions on that part of it? Well, it, the, the, this is great work, Kari, um, from the whole committee. Uh, much appreciated. Do you want us to have to make a motion um, and then yeah, have discussion? Please, please. I, I think that would be appropriate. Okay. Um, so uh, I'd entertain I'll, I'll a motion. Go, I'll, go, I'll go ahead and go move ahead. adoption of the two recommended goals from the Ed Quality Committee. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, sorry, um, I, I didn't hear where that came from. It was Dorothy, Dorothy. That was Dorothy. Thank you, Dorothy. Okay, so Kari moves, Dorothy seconds, open for discussion and questions, anything else? Brian. So you're muted, Brian. Sorry about that. Are we talking about both goals here? Uh, just the first one, I just thought. The first one. Uh, okay. Pause. Well, yeah. Okay. Thank you. If nothing, I'll move on to the second. Uh, should we um, should we vote on? Is, is are there two separate motions or one singular motion? I was going to do it as one. I'm I'm, I'm sorry if this is confusing. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm just. Uh, thank you. Okay, why don't why don't I move on to the second one? So the second one um, relates back to what Brian was just discussing about the curriculum review. Of course, at the retreat, we were focused on this curriculum review. And in our discussions, we realized that that was actually a piece of a larger project, which is the strategic planning and up updating a strategic plan for for the district. And so really the goal here is for the board to support that strategic planning initiative. We in fact started that tonight by authorizing the beginning of um, a bid process for the, for the review. Um, we really imagine this is gonna be a collaborative process, um, a joint effort between the board and the leadership team. Um, I guess I would say that the timeline on this is still emerging. Uh, in this goal, you see we contemplated wrapping up the strategic planning in the fall of 2021. Um, it looks like Brian took a closer look and in his memo, he's actually considering starting the strategic planning next fall. But nonetheless, the focus of this year will be that curriculum review. And then this goal um, also addresses our role as a board in the strategic planning. So a couple things 
where we'll be drawing on our better understanding of student achievement of the student learning outcomes that we're going to develop over the course of this year as, as part of the first goal. And then we will also participate in seeking input from the community um, into that strategic planning process um, and continuing the work that was, was done last year in that regard. So, um, so just keep in mind, this is in, in some way shaping up to be kind of like a two-year goal. It'd be relevant to our work plan next year. So I'm gonna stop there and see what questions and comments people have. Brian. Brian. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's and this is the one I was uh, talking. Uh, I'm very excited about uh, working and and working in collaboration with the board and the community and the teachers and the leadership team, uh, and developing a strategic plan that everyone can be really proud of. Uh, I, I I can't tell you how excited I am to tell you the truth. I'm I'm, I'm really excited that the board it, uh, is uh, very interested in, in considering this tonight. The uh, the I I. I really would love to have it done by you know the June 30th right before the school year ends but I think that's just way too asking for way too much we don't know when the uh, uh, you know pandemic and you know, I know uh, uh, Diane brought up you know, you know what happens if we do it you know, we're looking to do this curriculum management review and uh, we have a we have a, a two-month hiatus well we would have to build that into any strategic planning process that we would have to you know so things we have to be open to the fact that uh, it may take a little longer than June 30th, or it may take longer than the summer. Um, I'm also very interested in making sure that my leadership team gets a break this summer. They did not have a summer yet, so they've literally been going all out since last March. And you know, we also talk about you know the burnout. I know we talked about burning out teachers. I want to make sure they're not burned out either. So uh, I, I am concerned about them as well. Uh, they're not here. A lot of them left, which I'm glad. That's why I want them to go home and get some uh, rest. Uh, so. We put this down as a as a, a moving target. The September 2021. Uh, Kari and I were talking about it. Um, it. I'd love to get have it done by June, but I don't think that's that's. Uh, you know, I don't want to create a false deadline. You know, when and and let people down. Thanks, Brian. A any other comments, questions? Otherwise, we can move to a vote on um, the motion to approve these two board goals for student achievement. All in favor, please click yes. And opposed, click no. And I'm seeing um, unanimous yes. And um, thank you very much, everyone. And once again, great work to the Education Quality Committee. Um, all right, so we proceed to um, 4.2, review proposed VSBA resolutions. Do we have proposed VSBA resolutions? I saw an email from you, Dorothy, yes? Yes, yes. Um... I sent this to the agenda committee as well as to the whole board, but I'll read it again. Um, <clears throat> to send to the annual meeting this of is the Vermont School Board Association. Okay. Whereas Vermont School Board Association provides advice to school boards regarding labor and professional contracts, staffing levels, working conditions, and legislative actions. Therefore, be it resolved that the VSBA shall maintain complete independence from professional associations and labor organizations, including but not limited to the Vermont Superintendents Association, Vermont Principals Association, the NEA, and any other labor or professional organizations representing administrators or workers in our schools. Complete independence shall mean the organizations shall not share office space, legal counsel, mailings, staff or officials in any capacity. Now, I know we all received a letter from the VSBA explaining how um, they share, um, I'm going to use the word housing, sort of it's, it's a building which they share and so forth. And I think during the last um, couple of years when we were having um, disagreements about the Act 46, 
that many school districts um, felt that the VSBA was not really working as a school board association. They seemed to be um, following line with the superintendents association, the principal association. And in, and in many cases uh, for our particular district at the time, they were not really um, looking to the things that, that we asked them to. And I think now that we're seeing the outcome of Act 46 in many districts who kind of fell into line and discovered that they really hadn't been represented in the way they should have been, um, are thinking along those same lines that we think the school board association should be the school board association, not the school board superintendent principal association. So I would like I would like us to, to vote to send this as a resolution to the VSBA for them to consider at their annual meeting. And I will make a motion to that effect. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, is there a second to that motion? Oh, Scott? Yes, Chris. Did you second it? Okay. So uh, thank you very much. So Dorothy has moved that we accept that we approve the resolution for transmission to the VSBA for um, consideration at its annual meeting. Um, as she read, um, this is the kind of um, thing that we could probably discuss at length if we wanted to. Um, but I have a feeling that most people's minds are probably yeah. made up um, yeah. uh, at this point. So um, if anybody really wants to weigh in before we go to a vote, um, Dorothy, um, I, I don't want to give short shrift to, um, do you agree with that assessment of mine or would you like to have a fuller discussion of this? I, 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 since I sent it out ahead of time, if people read it, they had a chance to consider it. Um, and if somebody else has a comment, I'd appreciate it. But other than that, um, I don't want to lengthen the meeting any longer than it has to be. <clears throat> Thank you. Chris, as the, is there anything that you'd like to say? And then Floor? Um, you know, I would like to hear an explanation as to the, um, the process. If we vote on this resolution, it gets presented at the VSBA annual meeting. Um, and then wh what happens there? Um, my understanding is what happens there is they then consider it, they have a committee that considers all the different resolutions. And I assume the committee says, yes, we should look at this resolution and that one. And, and maybe if they didn't like this, they wouldn't consider it. But I think it would give, I, I, I see it as a message um, that we really want them to focus on board issues and not really get together with uh, supporting superintendent issues. Brian, I'm sorry, <laughs> and all principals, I'm sorry. But I, it does, it's, at, it's, its identity is a board association. So it seems to me it should focus more on board stuff. And I have appreciated some of the board stuff they have done and, and that's fine. I think they should focus more closely on that. And I do appreciate the fact that there have been some changes with some new people there. And I remember Scott sending that information around, but I still think that this is, an, is a message I would like to send. Thank you, Dorothy. I, I, I see Floor also has her hand up. Yeah, I just say about, just about process since if, if you guys don't know, I did get reelected to my old seat. We have new regions and now we are a Washington central region that includes Lemoyle. So the regions have changed a little bit, but I don't go want to go in that, into that. But what I do want to say is that what I was hoping the reason to change the title of the 
the agenda item today is that for us to go through the resolutions that actually have been submitted. So just to be clear on process, if we approve this right now, somebody would have to bring it up uh, at the meeting on the floor because the resolution, because we were not members last year, the resolutions for this year have already gone through the committee, uh, the committee that I had appointed last year. So if you receive your email, we have about nine resolutions that had already been vetted by the VSBA that those are the ones that would be, so if this one was to happen, it would have to be brought up on the floor. It, obviously it was gonna be a, uh, a Zoom meeting. I just wanted to put that out there uh, for, for you guys to, uh, to know. A, a question to floor. So I'm, I'm understanding that we voted to pay the dues, but then there's a time lapse. So officially we are not members for this annual meeting, is that correct? No, no, we, we are members. We would get to vote on the resolutions, but the, it, we just missed that timing, Dorothy. So the timing for submitting that was before July, but I think, I think for, I just wanted to make that clear for process. So I think we should just vote and then see, I just wanted to leave that, uh, just put that out there uh, when you're voting, that's the, all. The information that I got is that Yes, that committee would have brought stuff, but that yes, somebody could bring it to the floor. So that's what I was saying. Yeah, to the at, floor. At, yeah. the, at the meeting. Yeah, if we decided to pass this. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, um, Chris, I, I had my self restraint and not making another pun. <laughs> Floor's name. So. Um, uh, is there any further discussion uh, or shall we to a vote resolution? I actually have my hand up. Um, oh, sorry, Mindy. Okay. Uh, my concern or my disagreement with this is dictating where people have their office space. That is not something that's easy in central Vermont or Vermont in general to find space. It adds cost. And I think people can be in the same building and not necessarily, well, maybe they're influenced, I don't know. But I do not feel comfortable with telling somebody where they can have their space and adding the cost of moving and resetting up an office and all of that. And there are several organizations in that space. So that's my concern with that resolution. Um, I... Scott? Dorothy? Um, I, I think um, you may be, well, you're, yeah. I'm reading it differently as I understand they share a building and, and, and I understand to have them pick up and move, find somewhere else is, is not reasonable even. But this reads share office space. So they could be in the same building. It just means don't share the office space, you know, you each have your separate offices, which they may or may not, but that's the resolution that was passed around as, as appropriate at the time. But I don't think it had mean, meant at all to dispense with the building and start over. Right. So um, the resolution is essentially identifying a vulnerability, um, perceived vulnerability, that and offering um, a corrective. So are, are we ready to go to a vote? Uh, is there any other discussion? Am I missing anybody else? Otherwise, um, if you're in favor of the motion by Dorothy, seconded by Chris, to approve the resolution um, as read by Dorothy a few minutes ago. Please click yes. If no, click no. And what I'm seeing is five yes and six no, so the motion fails. Um, Thank you, everyone. And thank you for raising this. I think it continues to be something that needs to be paid attention to. Um, 
Scott, before you go, can I, sorry, can I ask for clarification? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, since the motion failed, does it, is this a moot point, but would someone email me the actual verbiage of that whole resolution or does that not matter at this point? I'll do that um, right now. Thank you. Oh, thank you, John. To the record. Yes, to thank to you. To the record, yeah, excellent. Thanks, and thank you again, Lisa. Um, all right, <clears throat> very good. So are we ready then to go on to the consent agenda? The minutes of seven. Uh, would anyone care to move those? So moved. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, second. Flora seconds. Thank you. I knew if we waited long enough, you you wouldn't be able to hold out. Good. Um, so discussion. Any changes? If not, are you ready to vote on the minutes? Vote to approve the minutes of October seven, as moved by Chris and seconded by Floor. Please click yes if you approve. No, if you disapprove. And I see um, all the yeses, so minutes are approved unanimously. Now, um, for board orders, um, does anyone have them handy? And I will not neglect my duty this time to remind you to kindly send an email um, for your electronic signature. I'll move that we approve board warrants in the amount of $308,746.59 and in the amount of $18,525. Sorry, can you repeat the first one? Sorry. $308,746.59 50 or 60, sorry, I'm getting tired. 50, 59. 50. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Great, okay. okay. Uh, so Chris has moved, uh, Kari, you're, you're seconding? Yes. Thank you. Um, any, any comments, uh, questions about the board orders? If not, we can go straight to a vote. All in favor, please click yes. Opposed, click no. And once, a, once again, I'm seeing a unanimous yes. And the motion carries. The board orders are approved. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, <clears throat> Next, we have personnel, but do we have personnel? There is no, uh, there's no action, no report tonight for this one. Wonderful. Um, and we have um, the ever popular second round of public comments. Um, if any of the public is um, interested in, in speaking, please raise your hand or identify yourself over the phone if, Ellen. Hi, I'm not sure if you can hear me. I'm, can you hear me? We can hear you just fine. Oh, okay, great. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm an, an instructional coach in the district. And I just wanna thank the board for agreeing to the two half days. I've been supporting teachers with Canvas and it has been a heavy lift and they're working really hard and there isn't a lot of time. So I'm just incredibly appreciative on their behalf. Thank you. Uh, our thanks to you as well and, and um, not only for your kind words but also for your work. Um, uh, any other members of the public wish to say anything. If not, we can go then to um, entertain a motion to go into executive session to discuss both 
negotiations and superintendent evaluation. Um, someone would care to make that motion. I move we enter executive session for the purpose of negotiation and superintendent evaluation. Thank you very much, Jonas. Do I'll we have second. a second? Lindy seconds. Lindy seconds. Thank you very much, Lindy. Um, all in favor, please click yes. Opposed, no. And everybody click yes. I believe the oh. session right. we will have board members and Brian only. Is that correct? No, okay. I, I no, I we need Lori in the negotiations and uh and Carla if she's yeah, and Carla. Lori and Carla? Yeah. I see Carla's here. I'm not sure if Lori's still here. That's the only issue. Um Oh, when I'd spoken to her. I know, let me, I can try calling her. Hey, Brian, while you're calling her, I have a technical question. This is uh, Jim. Um, should we stop, because it's a, um, a superintendent um, uh, evaluation component, should we stop the recording yeah. that's taking place? Um, we should yes. not be recording the um, executive session. That's correct. Okay. Actually, just real quick, I, I uh, guess Scott, um, real, real quick, it was it was breaking up at the end. I just want to confirm that you said that we will we are stopping the recording during executive session. Is that is that accurate? That is accurate. Yes. Excellent. Thank you, Scott. Well, we'll Thank be you. in a breakout room as well. Correct. That's right. I'll have to um, just as I'm learning the board, I'll have to I'll have to put each member into that into that breakout. Hey, Scott. Yes. Do you expect any action? Oh, David. Um, yeah. Hey. Uh, I don't. I don't think so, Jonas. Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. okay cool. Have yeah. a good one. There is no action to be taken. However, um, I will note that there are future agenda items. Um, Nine point one energy project consultant. Nine point two business administrator both of which are on the docket of the finance committee. So um, are, are there any other future agenda items that should be noted? If not, um, let's adjourn. Oh, oh, Kai, please. Yeah, just sorry, quick one. Do we wanna revisit the topic of uh, adjusting the uh, bylaws or the articles of agreement on the size of the board? Yeah, we can, we can we can definitely discuss that. Think about it um, um, I didn't catch that. Um, to, to revisit the articles of agreement on the size of the board. Okay, yep, fine. That is 15 versus you. some other yep. number. Um uh Jonas. You were able to note that? Okay. Um, did we lose Jonas? We lost Jonas. Uh, shame. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll um, tell him. I'll send him a okay. text right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Flora. Bye. Thank uh, you. There he is. Oh, there he is. Good. He was locked in the other oh, room. Stupid internet. I know. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so Jonas, uh, Kari proposed a future agenda item of revisiting the articles of agreement, specifically about size of the board. And otherwise, if there's nothing else, shall we adjourn by consensus at 1013? Yeah, Please. great. Thank you, Thank you so everybody. much, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Hey, Brian, 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 just give, give me a call. Thanks. I'll give you a call, Jonas. Thank Good night. You. Good night.